Perfect. Let's wait one, one more minute. Do you, you see it on YouTube already? Yeah. Great. Cool. Because my phone is loaded. Perfect. I just see an ad. So. Uh. Perfect. Okay. Come in. Get your seat. We haven't started yet, but we're close to start. Close to start. Hi. Um, yeah, welcome everybody <coughs> to the third edition of the workshop on open source design automation. So I'm very happy to see you here. We have a very interesting program today, although it's very dense, so, um, but you know in uh, short things, um, are very spicy. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, sorry. Uh, my name is Christian Krieg. Uh, I'm with Theo Wien and I'm the chair organizer of this workshop. So, if you have any questions, just approach me uh, in the coffee break or later in the conference and let me know what you're thinking. Okay, so, um, this is the introductory session, the welcome session of this workshop. And, of course, I have to say something about the workshop itself, some meta-information on OSTA. So, first of all, let me thank, uh, let me say thank you a few times. So, first of all, thank you to all these people who made uh, OSTA happening, who made it possible. Thanks to my uh, technical program committee who gave um, very precious um, suggestions on who to invite, um, who carefully checked and reviewed papers, who uh, were always here for me when I had questions. So thank you very much. Also I want to thank uh, my speakers, our speakers, our presenters, who uh, prepared a presentation, flew all the way here, um, except having jet lag, um, yes, and participate uh, here to um, update everyone on the new, on the current state of the art in open source design automation, sorry. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Um, also, I would like to thank um, you. So actually, um, I frequently asked for the numbers of uh, registrations, if you can call it like that, because technically you just expressed interest in the workshop, but constantly this workshop was the workshop with the most um, registrations. And um, on Friday, the numbers were as follows. So our workshop had 213 um, registrations, followed by other workshops, which you can see below. So thank you for your interest in this workshop, or more generally, in open source design automation. So this number shows that interest is here. It's um, it's present uh, and it's pressing, so um, yeah, it's, it's um, nice to see how this field is evolving. Um, of course, um, there are always costs associated to such um, events like this, so I want to thank our sponsors who provided resources for um, making OSTA possible. And <clears throat> last but not least, I also want to thank uh, the Date Conference Organization for doing such a great job in organizing such a nice event like Date Conference. I'm very happy that it uh, again uh, takes place in person. Um, and uh, I, whenever I had a question regarding the workshop organization, I was always, um, um, yeah, c cared about very, um, responsive and um, yeah so I had very great support for every question I had during the planning of the workshop so thank you also to date organization so what's ahead of us um, probably you noticed already the QR code uh, on the top right so um, 
you will see a bigger version of it right now if you uh, can scan it. So I would like to invite you to um, um, see at this um, website, it shows our program, where you can follow um, who is this current speaker, what's the next speaker, and uh, find additional information on the talks presented, links and material. And we will update um, the website also in the future with material. So um, please sign up for our newsletter or follow us on social media. You won't regret it uh, and we have a channel to address you because we don't have any idea who registered for this workshop because of the GDPR and um, similar regulations. We don't have any data about you. So if you want to get informed from us, please sign up and uh, yeah, don't miss any information on future events like this. So today we have uh, 12 invited speakers, so thank you very much for coming here. Uh, most of them coming from the US, having lots of travel um, and suffering from jet lag, so I really, really appreciate it. Also the costs that are associated with um, the traveling. And um, I'm also happy that one paper submission qualified for um, oral presentation today. So I'm very happy and curious about uh, what Franz will uh, present us later. Um, in the back, you will see four posters uh, which are ready for discussion. So please um, discuss with the poster authors um, and give them feedback. So you are the ones that could provide the best feedback because you are the experts. So thank you very much in advance. Unfortunately, two uh, invited speakers were not able to come. So um, we thought about having some remote presentation, but then um, yeah, we decided not to do it because our time here is very, very limited. So we thought it's better to not um, use it for remote presentations, but rather use it for discussion afterwards. So it, I, 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 I would suggest that we still try to um, maintain the schedule. And if we have time left at the end to have a, a free discussion where all, every, uh, all, all speakers are still here and where, you can, where we can all uh, discuss freely. So yeah, so we need a lot of discipline. So every talk lasts about 10 minutes and we have five uh, minutes of Q&A. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that we, we make it. Okay, so I also have to <laughs> maintain my timing. <laughs> so um, let me just briefly uh, pitch the posters which are attached in the back. So the first one uh, will be presented by Francesco Gonella, which is um, with uh, the University of uh, Birmingham. Um, and he will present an HDL, um, uh, <laughs> Git-based HDL repository. He will tell you more about it. Um, the second poster, so yeah, this is Francesco. <laughs> second poster is presented by Lukas Klemmer with um, Johannes Kepler University Linz, and he will um, present a waveform al analysis tool. Third poster is presented by Stefan Riesenberger. Uh, he is working on um, uh, characterizing FPGA architectures for uh, estimating power on FPGA architectures. And um, Wamsi Wittler will uh, present um, his slide set instead of a poster. Um, uh, and he will present a register map automation tool for Verilog. So um, I guess I uh, blocked enough time for this workshop. So uh, I, without further ado, I would like to hand over to um, our first speaker. Larry Doolittle, so he's with um, uh, Lawrence National Berkeley Laboratory in the US, and he's famous for his tool um, Verilog to VHDL or VL, v VHD to VL. Sorry, so it's time for me to hand over this presenter. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, good. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to rub shoulders with so many smart people. 
Uh, and while this community knows me for VHD2VEL, at least some of you might, um, that's that my, my primary focus is really using FPGAs and all these open source tool chains to do DSP for particle accelerators. So this is a hobby project of mine, uh, but I, I'm glad some people find it useful. And, um, yeah. And lawyers, you'll see why. Um, so I, I want to tell you what VHD2VL is, for those of you do, who don't already know, where it came from, how it fits into the general toolkit, and what does it tell us about code. I, I think it's kind of interesting, actually. Um, in summary, it converts uh, VHDL to Verilog, at least some dialects of VHDL. Uh, it's up on GitHub. It's licensed under GPL v2. And I just want to, and I want to point out that this question, can I convert VHDL code to Verilog, keeps coming up. Maybe not enough to call it frequent, but if you go back in the records and scan forums, and Google is actually great at this, you can find questions going back a long time. It keeps coming up. And every time it pops up, the immediate question is, why do you want to do that? Well, people have their reasons. And then the second immediate answer is no. And then eventually somebody says, try some proprietary program. Maybe it'll work. And then uh, variant on that, try synthesizing with Vivado or Quartus or something. And then you can usually you can get that to re-emit the, the consequences of its synthesis into some portable form like, excuse me, like Verilog. But always this comes with the caveat that any results you get will be totally, well, maybe not totally, but probably useless for maintenance. Um, you can find, at least I had trouble last night finding any tables that show the corresponding syntax, right? They're both hardware description language, at least when you go to the synthesis subset. So this is how you say and in Verilog. Here is how you say and in VHDL. Here's how you create a, a loop in Verilog. Here's how you do it, right? Just, it's the same. It's doing the same stuff just with different syntactic sugar. So you'd say, well, if I have a short program and maybe I'm not an expert in VHDL or Verilog, or you should be an expert in one or the other. But if I have it in one form, I should be able to follow the rules and convert it to the other thing. But that's what computers are for. So in 2003, Vincenzo posted his answer to a programming forum and says, I wrote a translator that supports a limited but useful subset of synthesizable VHDL. Blah, blah, blah. Since we have no commercial interest in such software, I decided to release it under GPL. So he did it. So that's VHD2VL, at least the first version. Um, so he's, he's actually based in Australia, and he, he really didn't do much maintenance on that for, for a while, uh, uh, after the first couple of years. So I, I found it useful. I was using it, and I saw problems with it. So it is open source, so I started contributing back, and that has made me the maintainer since 2005. Uh, I got some help from Alejandro, from, sorry, from Rodrigo in Argentina, starting a couple, like six years ago. That's been very helpful. Um, so now that we have VHDL to VHD to VL, now the real answer is wrong answer. Okay, real answer is forum posters still don't know about it, so they still post that they're they're obsolete answers. If you find VHDL written by pragmatic hardware engineers. That usually works, works just fine with this code. If you get some software designer who's enamored with the high-level features of VHDL, maybe that won't work so well. And uh, this is really coming out of a Unix paradigm. It's based on, right, it's just a Unix program. Um, so I, I, I assume there are some Windows users out there. Um, if you can run VHD2VL under WSL, Windows, what's it called, Windows Subsystem for Linux, Send me an email, and, and I can say now it's a Windows program too. Um, there are other other recipes and programs out there. Uh, I found one written in Java, but is apparently pre, free to download if you give your email and some other information. It's definitely not open source. Um, people use GHDL for this purpose. Uh, Icarus Verilog made an attempt to do this, so they could parse uh, parse VHDL, uh, but that's now abandoned, and I'm pretty sure marked as deprecated. Um, and there was that comment before that any result would be totally unreadable. Um, I hope the font size lets you look at this. Um, and I hope, so the left, these are, this is one particular example in our test set. 
uh, for our code base. The left side is bog standard uh, description of a, of a counter in, or a frequency divider in VHDL that I've forgotten the provenance of, um, but it works. And if you use VHDL, VHD to VL on it, you get the Verilog on the right. It took some really, really small edits to get it to squash onto the page here. I took out a couple of new lines. Uh, but I hope you find that the right-hand side is perfectly legible. And in fact, even most of the comments are preserved. In some contexts, that's actually a real killer feature. So it's not that it, it's, I mean, the machine generation side is good and it's pretty, it's accurate. If it fails, it fails at the, at the parsing step, not, at the, not by generating wrong code. But the result is actually, actually legible, so you could actually import that into a pure Verilog code base. Hello. Um, and I think this, this calls into focus um, some comments about what a program really is. And the ability, so once you write down a program in, in your text editor, it has a life of its own. This is why we license code. So it can go on and be, re be reused. Um, but this forces you to, to manipulate your, that your program with other programs. So you write your Verilog and you translate it. You compile it, you synthesize it, you lint it. You write your VHDL, you compile it, you translate it, you lint it, you store it in your Git repository. Having links between all of these uh, parts of the chain is crucially important. Uh, this is uh, the tools to do this to manipulate programs range from outlandishly, outlandishly complex like GCC to really simple. Right? If I have said, then I can start making making uh, bulk changes to the program to meet my changing needs. Um, and VHDL is just one more. Uh, one more program in that suite of tools to manipulate other programs. And I want to point out that tools like this are useless unless people can picture what they do and apply them productively. And it's easy, at least for some audiences, like the people in this room, to say, if you have VHDL and you want Verilog, grab VHD to VL and it should do a pretty good job for you. Try it, right? Don't assume it will work until you verify it uh, empirically, but uh, it's a tool kind of out of the Unix paradigm from the 1970s. Um, and I want to, I, I hear a lot about AI at this workshop, at this conference. I mean, it's not obvious to me that AI means anything in this regime. Uh, we, we value tools that are reproducible, regression testable. I don't see any sense that AI is going to be in that category. Maybe it can, it can be a, a mechanism to help find bugs. Okay, if it, we've done fuzzing for a long time to look for bugs in software. Maybe AI will help us find our bugs, but then we need to turn it into an actual test. I missed, wait, 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 wait. Hmm, I jumped across a couple here. Okay, so I want to, uh, I want to compare VHD to VL with a couple of other programs. And this is why I say that, that I'm, I'm lucky to rub shoulders with such brilliant people in this room. Um, it's a tiny fraction, tiny fraction of the size of some of these other programs. And we have, I, I, I counted six contributors to current. Uh, this is a far cry from what, what these other tools are. Internally, VHD2Vail uses Flex and Bison, but a third of it is actually just standard C99. So it's not a big program, but it's, fun, it's a useful program. Yeah, I, I wanted to get this. What is a program? I said that here, but kind of the introduction to that, data is code. Buffer exploit writers know that. Code is speech. There's a US Supreme Court decision that validates that. And code is data. So being able to use code as data, this is, this is the innovation from Grace Hopper and kind of building on John von Neumann that computers, programming computers is a real thing. And that, that's where, right, that's, that's what takes com, uh, uh, software and makes it an investment instead of a one-time use punch card drawing equations on a piece of paper. So all I want to really say is that VHDL can play a role in putting code to work in new ways. Of course, I'm eager to get 
successes and bug reports. I want to end with one little comment here. I have a few seconds. Um, I, it's, I think it's really uh, uh, intriguing that I get to give this talk in Antwerp, where if, when I walk down the street, businesses don't care what language they give you their information in. It could be French or German or Flemish or English. They, they, they don't care, and people can cope. Historically, computers haven't really coped well with multi-language input. So VHD to VL is a, maybe a very small piece, but I think it's a constructive piece in this, this world where, where you can't assume that everything is, is uniform. So, Donc Vell. Thank you very much, Jerry. This is, was a nice concluding remark. So, and you perfectly matched your 10 minutes, so I'm very impressed. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, please, questions. Okay. What's the boundary between what will work and what won't work? And how does the user know when it works? Um, there is, well, I mean, you can read the readme, and there are about 10 points to watch for. Um, uh, and then in the end, you just try it and see if it crashes or gives you a useful result. Straight register transfer level is good. Um, uh, uh, generate loops, or whatever VHDL calls them. I, I'm, a, I'm a Verilog guy, not a VHDL guy. So. Uh, uh, yeah, complicated things. Uh, what do you call them? Uh, your face is, uh, I, I, I forget the. Second part of my question: How does the user know when it works? Oh, uh, it, it, if it errors out, then it didn't work. If it if it if it produces if it produces output, it's uh, it's supposed to be correct. So this is going to be a naive one, but is there more of a need for a VHDL to very low versus a very low to VHDL? And uh, you know, any comments along those lines? It I'm, seems this very one is directional. Um, yeah, this is one directional. Um, I, I commented that I, I think uh, Icarus Verilog can do Verilog to VHDL. I don't. It, it won't preserve comments, uh, but I think it's pretty readable output. Okay. Can you repeat that name? Icarus Verilog. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. I can ask a slightly annoying question. What happened to the assertion statement at the end of your code example? Which one? The the big code example yeah, in the build in the VHDL you have an assert at the second to last line and I don't see it in the Yep. No, it, it doesn't understand asserts. I mean it's not fun it's not it's not an assert is not synthesizable. So that we're doing the synthesizable right. subset. So for for non synthesizable in, in the, be the best scenario is it, ignore it ignores it, yeah. right? It cool, thank you. So, more questions? Is there a parsing limit for the code? I'm sorry? Is there any limit for the boundaries of the code? And the certain lines you can, you can process or...? Uh, it, can, it can process a cert, but it ignores them. Again, if for details like this, you should really look at the, I mean, there, there's a line by line, right? These are the things to watch out for in the readme. It, it's not that long, right? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a textbook. It's, it's like two pages long for, for all the, in the readme, including a checklist of things that it, it can and cannot do. All right, the little things like um, uh, VHDL is case insensitive and Verilog is case sensitive. So v, this program is case retentive, and that that could trip people up. Thank you. We still have time for one more question. I mean, this seems like a big job to, to achieve this translation. Can you give me some um, I mean, use cases? Like why why were you so? It, it, it's 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 three thousand lines of code. It's not, a, it's not a big deal. Why, would you, why did you have to drive to want to translate PhD? Oh, uh, we, I was working on a, a collaborative project where I wanted to write Verilog, and my, one of my co-workers wanted to write VHDL, so we found a way to just make it work. <laughs> so if you're a Verilog guy, you try to turn everything into Verilog. <laughs>
Well, and at, at least at the time of that writing, uh, GHDL was very immature, and Icarus Verilog worked really well. So thank you very much, uh, Larry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Antonio Tomio is with uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and he is famous for his software um, defined architecture synthesizer. So please just let me move this mouse pointer. So. Okay, perfect. So, welcome, uh, Antonio. Thank you for the introduction, Christian. And uh, I'm uh, briefly presenting uh, the Soda Synthesizer, which is a uh, work of uh, many people, including Fab Professor Fabrizio Ferrandi for the high level synthesis tool. He's uh, on the room, in the room. We just gave the, the tutorial this morning, so hopefully you attended also that. And you know what I'm going to talk about, which is like motivating the work first. So uh, obviously, uh, data science uh, algorithms approach frameworks, they keep evolving. That's an artificial intelligence world now, right? And uh, we know that the domain-specific accelerator are kind of the only way to keep uh, increasing performance in type uh, energy constraints. And uh, like uh, all the accelerators that exist today are really typical hardware process, right? Find a pattern that you can accelerate, iterate, uh, new application, find another pattern. There is a productivity gap here. And uh, the, the instead, uh, like we, in the world that we are now, uh, the, the, uh, the actual uh, algorithm designer wants to have an opportunity to take and design its own uh, custom accelerator. So, uh, the reality is that we need the tools to quickly transition from uh, the uh, model, uh, machine learning model or data analytics pro program down to the chiplet implementation. Our solution is uh, the Soda Synthesizer. Uh, it's a modular, multi-level, interoperable, extensible, open source hardware compiler <laughs> from high level programming framework to silicon. It's so, compiler based because it has a front end that is based on MLIR, it's called SODAPT, and it's compiler based because the back end is based on a state of the art high level synthesis tool, Panda Bamboo. Uh, we also support a coarse grain reconfigurable array generator, still open source, open CG array. I'm, I'm going a little more into the detail of, uh, of, of Bamboo in this presentation. Uh, in all cases, we generate a synthesizable variable, and targets can be both FPGAs or uh, ASICs. Uh, the beautiful thing is, uh, since this is uh, uh, all compiler-based, obviously, design space exploration is changing compiler optimization uh, passes uh, and parameters, right? And, and, and you can build uh, your own design space exploration algorithm in this way. And there are a few references, uh, if you want more details, obviously, in uh, 10 minutes is uh, difficult to go through all of it. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the front end is SODAPT. Uh, uh, it's based on MLIR. Uh, SODAPT stands for Search, Outline, Dispatch, Accelerate, and Optimizer. It's based on MLIR, as, as, uh, as I was saying, because it's also used now in a lot of uh, high-level machine learning tools. Uh, like uh, TensorFlow, Runtime, Onyx to MLIR, PyTorch to MLIR. We support those lower to uh, linear algebra in, in MLIR and then start with our optimization. You uh, sort out does the, the partitioning and the optimizations of the, of the snippets that you partition and you want to accelerate. And uh, also generates, that's the other beautiful thing of MLIR, is that you can you generate uh, LRDM IR or runtime calls, and you can generate also all the glue logic uh, to uh, uh, control the accelerators from the, um, from the host. Um, it's open source, <laughs> and that's the link. Uh, you can find also the tutorial from this morning, I guess. The backend, uh, in particular the HLS backend, is uh, Panda Bamboo. It's, uh, Potentially now, the, at least in terms of development, uh, the only open source uh, uh, high-level synthesis tool remaining uh, that is complete in a sense. Uh, key features that we added during the years, parallel accelerator support, uh, modular high-level synthesis, and support to target ASICs with open source tools. <laughs> and, uh, uh, obviously, uh, we want to verify whatever the high-level synthesis tool does, so there is a, a significant part that is devoted to generate automated testing and verification. It's modular. We also support commercial tools, but today we are talking about open source, right? The LLDMIR, obviously, you can feed that to Vivad HLS, and we have numbers to prove it. <laughs> but why an HLS backend, and why loop, uh, going through progressive lowering? Well, 
maybe you with HLS you are not going to get the fastest solution possible, especially if you want to do true lowering. But uh, if you have a good uh, HLS engine, you can still deal uh, uh, with a general solution and, and generate an accelerator. And you can provide opportunities, right? Also for uh, finding specialized patterns and create custom accelerators. We use that, for example, to do the, the support for multi-threaded accelerators. And uh, like uh, uh, with, with, with respect to the other solutions that use HLS, like we do, uh, we, we keep going through progressive lowering, which is like how a compiler should do, right? It's more elegant and you don't need to raise and lose uh, information from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the fact that you are writing back uh, something in higher level. And again, as I said, the new optimizations are compiler passes and you can the device design space uh, optimization problem right? as a compiler design space optimization. Couple of words on the ASIC target in particular. Uh, we also uh, tested with uh, commercial tools, but we regularly, and that's also the focus of, uh, of our tutorial, use uh, the open road suite, both for the, the, with the open PDK 45 nanometers and the ASAP 7 nanometer cells, so that you can really uh, evaluate uh, your algorithms from the high level uh, uh, implementation down to the results provided by open road. And uh, Bamboo has a feature uh, through a tool to characterize the, the resource library, uh, depending on the target uh, technology. And it's used for both the FPGA target and uh, like uh, OpenPDK and ASAP are, are provided. Uh, this is just a list of the optimization that SODOPT uh, supports. I'm not going too much into the details through them. The key information is that we do optimization for both memory and the computational intensity before, once they are, uh, the, 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 the code are snippet, the code snippet is separated, uh, the code snippet that you want uh, to accelerate is separated from the rest of the application. And uh, like the, the memory optimization are obviously very relevant uh, because you, you can localize things and, and then uh, work together with the synthesis tool to add buffers, for example, on multiple memory ports. To demonstrate the flow, there are a few numbers of, with polybench with days up seven nanometers, but probably the nicest thing is this picture, right? <laughs> Par partitioned, we partitioned the LNET, uh, in, uh, and, and then uh, we, this is uh, generated with an NAND gate, uh, uh, free with 45 nanometers, and you can see the version that are not accelerated and the version that are accelerated with the optimization from sod out. Obviously, the, the, it's, it's visually is nice, uh, the, <laughs> the, the uh, optimized solutions are, are bigger, but they are also faster, and I think I have the number, in, whoops, yeah, but like in general, right, they, they are faster. And quickly going through in the last couple of minutes, a uh, couple of research opportunity. Obviously, this is the open source <laughs> design automation workshop, the open source ecosystem, right? I hope that uh, you quickly saw how SODAP right now demonstrate that open source tools can uh, seamlessly integrate, right? Uh, obviously, I worked on Bamboo, but we developed uh, uh, the Soda Opt on top of it after. And uh, we use uh, Open Road regularly. So there is a great opportunity to do this, right? And, uh, and, and you can also integrate with commercial tools. Uh, uh, actually, with Professor Andrew Kang, we had a special session in ICAD talking about that. And that's, that's another opportunity that with open source tool we have that before was not available. Uh, there is uh, significant opportunities to support uh, intellectual property and IP blocks. There, there are opportunities in supporting uh, uh, um, prototyping platform and FPGA generators. I think also Professor Gallardo had the talk uh, today on OpenFPGA, right? So that's, that's another opportunity. You can configure even the FPGA uh, that you're, or the embedded FPGA that you're going to generate. Yeah, one example of a platform, for example, is uh, the embedded uh, scalable platforms from Columbia University, uh, with when we are working, right, with uh, Bamboo as the open source tool. And uh, like other thing, this is a compiler. Uh, so profile-driven synthesis, uh, you can, especially on the memory part that I was talking about, you can take optimized instrument on a host and then regenerate the architecture that is optimized for it. And I have one minute, but I need to flash this. 
if you, don't, if you didn't understand already, it's all open source, it's all available. There is the whole tutorial. You just take the picture, go visit, try, try the tool. But yeah, that's the Soda Synthesizer. We implement an end-to-end -end, uh, silicon compiler, uh, compiler base for the generation of uh, domain-specific accelerators. So hopefully, it's a first step, right, in creating this ecosystem of open source tool that can go from my level specification down directly to the other. And I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonino. Also, you uh, met your 10 minutes requirement perfectly. So, um, we have time for questions. Thank you. So, I did not really understand how the standard cells can be picture when you do uh, the, uh, the part number. This one? Yeah, so can you elaborate a little more? Oh yeah, uh, it's, so uh, this is just an example on how we do the partitioning, right? We were tasked, uh, in, in, in this case, we were tasked to, to kind of generate chiplets out of this, this network, right? So what we did was uh, uh, using, using MLIR, we can do partitioning of the specification at the different granularities. We, we are, we decided, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a simple thing, right? We decided to partition operator by operator. And then we went through the optimizations uh, of uh, our MLIR tool to optimize uh, the different accelerators for each of the operators. But like, um, this is more, again, it's visually nice. Uh, the, the complete study, study also looks at how you kind of actually do the operator uh, fusion, right? Because sometimes this is not convenient. But like, this was uh, kind of a, a nice example to show end-to-end -end, uh, synthesis. Suppose that then you want to attach this with chiplets, right, with a uh, chiplet interface. That's a simple pipeline that implements the, the model. Okay, and thank you for an interesting work. It's not fully clear to me yet to what extent you can most, or you focus on generating customer hardware accelerators, let's say, versus fully programmable flexible accelerators, which will indeed require some form of compiler generation as well, to which you believe will be into the end. So, Yes, uh, I don't have the right picture here, but um, like the, the main focus of this is fully custom accelerators, right? Uh, use uh, use uh, the MLIR tool, this one, ah, this is a little better, <laughs> use the MLIR tool to, to, to partition the specification uh, at different granularities, right? If, if you uh, look at our tutorial, we show, we can do operator by operator depending on the uh, uh, dialect of MLIR that you choose, or uh, insert a specific part of our soda dialect to decide where to do the, the, the partitioning. And this can be obviously automated. Then, though, MLIR has a, a, a wonderful thing, that uh, one of the lowering target by default uh, is a runtime, right? You can define your own runtime. So that uh, generates the glue logic for, uh, for instead uh, the microcontroller. Okay. The accelerator is a function, but you yes. can hook it up to flex yeah. It's fixed function. Obviously, with high level synthesis, right, you can even write your kind of changing adaptable accelerator in C and then, and then they get it converted. Is, is, uh, is uh, efficient? No, not always, but. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? I saw you. Hi, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I would be interested in how you represent parameters in the finalized design for network parameters. Uh, for, uh, for, the, for the machine learning model? Yes. Uh, so, uh, parameters are, can be either constant or can be loaded from the memory. One, one of the things that we are studying with actually uh, uh, accelerator where you can change the modality, right, is if, is if they need to be input stationary. Or, they, uh, or you want uh, something that is out, out of stationary and you need to stream in, uh, to stream in uh, the weights. They are uh, stored in memory in, uh, in our model, right? And then and bro brought in into a local VRAM before computation. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, for my question regarding the result that you presented that you have four X area increase on Yep. 15x uh, speed up. Is it because you, uh, the focus of the optimization is on, on speed up? Uh, yes. So is it possible to 
to do some multi-constant optimization? Yes. So I don't have the slide here, but uh, one, one of the things that you can do is obviously uh, explore, uh, uh, set, set which parameter you want to, uh, to, to meet, right? And, and, then, and then perform uh, like the, the uh, sort of optimization passes uh, trying to meet those constraints. Uh, it's, it's not completely uh, uh, finalized yet, but uh, we are adding a, a design space exploration engine in Python where you should be able to implement your own heuristic right to do also the exploration, changing the parameters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's time for me to introduce our next speaker. Um, probably I don't have to introduce him. He's very famous for his uh, work in OpenRAM. So welcome with me, Matthew Goodhouse from UCLSC, so Santa Cruz. You okay, so please to present. There we go. Yeah, thank you everybody. So um, thank you for the nice introduction. Hopefully I won't be, won't be the first one to disappoint by going over 10 minutes, but uh, we'll see, I have a lot of slides. So um, now I'm not gonna talk a lot about kind of what OpenRAM is, how it works, and so on. I've given a number of other talks online that we can you can look at. This one's actually gonna focus a lot more on some actual first silicon test results that we've gotten and measurements and so on. But you know, the TLDR, OpenRAM's a memory compiler in Python. Um, it has kind of reference flows and so on. I think the newest things in the last six to nine months are you can now pip install OpenRAM. Um, it doesn't pip install all the Skywater stuff because that's um, quite a big set of cells and libraries, but um, we're working on something for that. And then we've also moved as well from a Docker type setup to more of a Comda type tool setup. So we're kind of making improvements to it from a software perspective over time, which is interesting. Now the interesting thing is we've actually gotten back some of our first results. We've made two test chips. Um, the first one was OR1 that we, I did with eFabulous and Google way back before the Google Skywater Open MPWs. Um, so this was kind of a dedicated test chip to get that going. Um, this actually was all open source open RAM except the DRC LVS was still the proprietary PDK from Skywater. Um, and we, then we did another test chip and we've actually done two more since then this. But the second test chip was actually using the Caravel project with um, eFabulous, and we did you know, 10 SRAMs on this, including uh, five dual port memories, five single port memories with a bunch of different configurations to kind of um, be able to hopefully test and, conf and um, characterize the memories in real silicon. Now, some of the challenges, you may think, oh, memory compiler is easy, it's just a you know, for embedded for loop, you make the array, you're done. Um, it's not quite that simple. You know, it's, there's a lot of control logic and, and annoying things you have to deal with. Um, one of the annoying things is how to deal with the bit cells when they're foundry specific bit cells. Um, specifically, the, found, the bit cells from Skywater were our first experience with this because we were originally an open source tool with a free PDK and scalable CMOS um, technology, which we didn't have anything about the lithography information in those processes. So Skywater started to expose us to some of that stuff. And we had some reference arrays of known bit cells from Skywater, and we basically reverse engineered an old memory to basically make the open RAM for Skywater. And as you can see here, um, we have an example of a, the dual port bit cell, which we extracted from a, an array. And this included a, um, it included a, a strap cell as well as a, a well tap cell all in one. You know, and then uh, the second iteration we started adding, that was on the first tape out. And then the second tape out we added the single port memories, which this had a much more dense and complicated uh, bit cell layout, including you know, custom corner cells and in a lot more integrated um, optical proximity correction for the lithography. And so we, were, we had to do a, a more customized placement of the array, which required uh, writing some new code to do that for OpenRAM using our kind of plugin interface to do custom modules. And you can see here uh, the, the single port bit cell along with a separate strap cell and the corner cells. Um, so you can see the size difference of the bit cells. This is a little bit unfair because this dual port cell on the left includes um, the tap cell and the one on the right does not, but the difference in size is quite dramatic. 
And you can also see kind of the customization of the layout of the cell of the single port is, um, you know, uses some non-rectilinear geometries and so on. So it's a much denser cell. Now, one of the challenges we had was how to verify these. So our first tape out, we used the commercial tools, which were able to handle a lot of these proprietary rules. The open source tools are le were less flexible to the non-user design rules. So because the SRAM cells have all of these OPC layers that help with the lithography, they violate a lot of the design, user design rules. And so we basically went with an approach to um, replace the, the bit cell and any sort of offending cell with an abstract view cell that passes DRC, but doesn't necessarily have all of the features in the cell. You can see here an example of the, the 6T single port SRAM cell which we use to actually do the connectivity analysis to make sure that the bit lines, at least some of the high level stuff passes DRC while ignoring the other contents of the, the bit cell. Now, so that's kind of how we address the main arrays. Um, we also had some other kind of custom stuff needed for our control logic in our memory. We do a replica based control scheme where we use a kind of a, a fake column that is pre all the bit cells are pre-programmed to a logic zero and we use that to generate the timing for our um, array and in order to do this we had to generate a replica bit cell in red that's programmed to zero and as well as a dummy bit cell that has the bit lines disconnected and so we made those cells by very slightly perturbing the layout and we're hopefully going to be getting some x-ray with um, x-ray analysis of these bit cells to see how good our guesses were and how the lithography would play out. Um, the benefits of open source community is someone's gonna do that for us. And we did the same with the uh, dummy bit cell as well. Now, uh, decoders, I'm gonna skip ahead to some of the actual results. So we taped out, Oop, jumped ahead too quickly. There's our actual dye photomicrograph of the first one. Uh, we don't have the second one yet, but we have it on our this actual silicon. And who thought you'd see a shmoo plot in an open source um, uh, talk? But we've actually got uh, silicon measurements of that first SRAM, and it's, it's functional. I think the main challenge was a lot of the routing at the top level. We didn't buffer a lot of the signals to do timing optimization to connect to the SRAM. So we're actually limited in performance by the, the interconnect connecting to the SRAM rather than the SRAM itself. And you can see, you know, we tested over a different set of corner, uh, temperatures, um, voltages, and so on. And it was working up to around 40 megahertz, which is uh, not bad for a, for a first go. And then we also did um, you know, uh, voltage um, measurements as well. And then finally, we did a voltage retention uh, analysis. And we see that it retains voltage down to about 440 millivolts. Then we raise the voltage back up and be able to read the contents back. So we actually have some characterization results, um, which are encouraging. And then the second test chip, we have it on my desk. It's configuring the IOs, and we don't have a lot of life out of it yet. But hopefully I can talk to Tim more, and we can come up with plans to get it um, a little more analyzed. It's one of the reasons I'm here. And so future work, we've also just released Open ROM. So this is a, a NAND ROM uh, generator. It's not integrated with Open Lane yet. We're porting to Global Foundry's 180, and we also got some reram test structures on the last MPW, and we're working on reram arrays in OpenRAM as well. So, a lot of different different information. I don't think I went too far over my 10 minutes, and I do want to have, leave time for t some questions. So, thank you very much, Max. So you still would have two minutes. Uh, hey. Okay. So Yeah, so the Python itself is, um, it implements a lot of stuff. It uses a lot of open source tools in the back end for simulation, DRC, LVS. We try to use kind of a wrapper idea where we disguise the, the interface. So we can, we can use, for example, simulation with um, you know, HSpice, NGSpice, SICE, you know, any simulator that's kind of standard, we have an interface to it. Um, Inside OpenRAM itself, we actually have a lot of data structures for layout, for hierarchy um, of 
logic, you know, transistors, devices. We have a data structure and an API to basically interface with all of that. And so it's, it's meant to be it's meant to be a flexible interface that you can do, basically generate any sort of custom layout, you know, whether that's regular. Yeah, I mean, my experience is that any structural code that starts to get sizable, which is not sort of, you know, like you learn, it, it gets unmanageable. Yeah, we, we also have some, it does become unmanageable in a certain extent, but we also start to automate certain things. Like we have um, a channel router. We have, we actually have a, a maze router that's not very good, but it's a maze router for connecting some things. So there are some things that are a little more automated, but um, make it a little more manageable. And we're, we always sacrifice area for um, portability is our key. We want it to be portable. The layout's not very dense in a lot of cases. Yeah, question. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. It's the question of how much uh, more area efficient your generator will be when one kilobyte SMU in normal design people say, yeah, just uh, use the RTL synthesis and if you have enough chip area, this will yeah. at least be in one flow working and not much uh, lose of area. Did, did you compare yes. your generator with uh, using a standard uh, tool flow for, for the same sizes of, of SM? So if you were to use a 1K like um, flip-flop or latch-based RAM, we're probably like 4X smaller. All right. It's, it's, it's considerable. Once you're above a couple hundred bits, we're, we're a savings. Um, compared to a commercial compiler of memories, I would say we're 30% worse, that ballpark. There's a lot of improvement needed there. Um, but again, our goal has always been portability and productivity. And then we have that on the horizon to go back for density and layout, but that's kind of a secondary goal still. I'm always looking for help, though. If people want to help with that, that'd be, that'd be good. Yeah, you're great. So, okay, thank you. I said follow-up question on Python uh, as a program. So this is a Realm of C++ usually uh, for this type of work. But have you ever run into a moment of, aha, so maybe we should not choose Python because of a performance problem or, or not? So um, I would say the only reason I've said, aha, we shouldn't have chosen Python is because it's horrible at object-oriented design. <laughs> um, and we started the project in Python 2. Point whatever it was, way back, actually, quite a long time ago. And Python's evolved over time as well. And we didn't necessarily pick up on a lot of the design practices early on, which they happened after we started the project. So like naming schemes to help with object-oriented and stuff like that. Um, you know, the PD, what are, what are they called? The Python, um, like, suggestions, the design suggestions. Uh, so that's the only reason I've said I, I reconsidered, would re reconsider Python as that, um, the, how it can abstract and so on. But that's not a fundamental limitation. And we've been revising it over time, so I think it keeps getting better and better. More questions? Is ECC on your roadmap? So we, that's a good question. ECC, we support extra rows and columns already. And we have, I had a student do a master's project where we do a soft Verilog wrapper to do the self-test and repair. So you have extra glue logic that gets synthesized, but we, and we have redundant rows and columns. Um, yes. More questions? We still have two minutes. Are, are there any uh, sort of road blockers or, or sort of like uh, the opposite, which is like avenues that you see where you can uh, you can wrap up the thing? Not a incremental approach, but like a, you know a, a big step. And, uh, so I, like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, my my thoughts are changing how we think about memories and design is a big thing. Like right now, the common thing is for. Uh, designers just to instantiate a memory and be like, I need this much memory. That's a bad approach. Like, it should be more of a synthesis type approach to that. I think interfacing with the high level tools like Open Road, Yosis, that's, that's where there's a lot of potential. And, and it's not really possible with a lot of the commercial or proprietary compilers because you don't have as much flexibility, so. 
We have still time for one more question. I started early, by the way, so <laughs> it gives me all the extra time. Thanks, Matt. So, uh, how about in the, you know, go further, how about now CC cell like 80, 20, that, you know, especially for processing with memory? Yeah, so um, we intentionally wrote it that the type of bit cell doesn't really matter. Um, it, it does rely a little bit on, on differential signaling. So if you went to a single-ended, you'd have to change your SenseAmp um, scheme. And there are probably some stuff you'd have to fix. But our intent was that you would be able to change your cell. And we've written it that it's very flexible in that. It's also very flexible in, for example, like your decoder. You can override our default decoder and make your own. And it's, it's intended to very be very abstract. You know, modifiable in that way. Great, so thank you again. Okay. Matt. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, T.W. Wang from the uh, University of Utah. Uh, he's uh, the author of uh, Open Timer, but today he will present a different project, Taskflow. So sure. thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chong Wei Huang, and you can just call me TW. Today, I'm going to talk about TaskFlow. It's a general purpose task parallel programming system to help you more easily parallelize the EDA application. And you probably, many of you already know, parallel computing, or parallel heterogeneous computing, is very, very critical for your application performance. Uh, for example, if you look at the machine learning uh, today without GPU or even with uh, heterogeneous power and using one GPU, we are able to achieve over 100 x speed over that with CPU alone. So that's the power of power in heterogeneous computing. But writing a parallel program itself is not a very easy job because you have to deal with a lot of technical and parallelization detail. For example, you have to worry about the parallelism and abstraction either over software or hardware, and then you have to worry about the concurrency control, task data rates, dependency constraints, schedule efficiency, load balancing, and even performance portability, and so on and so forth. And there's always this trade-off okay, between what you really want and the cost of that design. For example, everybody wants simple, maintainable, extensible, and portable implementation, but each of that design may steal your application performance a little bit. And I do believe nobody really wants to manage all this technical detail themselves. So it turns out we want a programming solution that can sit on top to help us handle all these technical details and challenges. Uh, but why does existing parallel programming system uh, do not work, especially for EDA problem? Well, if you look at many of these EDA applications, they are very, very complicated and very complex. Existing system, they are typically very iterative cycle and so on and so forth. So from the evolution of parallel programming standard, uh, turns out uh, we can envision that the task parallelism is going to be the best model for us to describe heterogeneous workload or parallel computing workload because it captures your intention in decomposing a parallel heterogeneous algorithm into a top-down task graph that eventually can be scaled to different accelerator. So our solution over here is called TaskFlow, uh, which was supported by our NSF project to overcome many of the challenges, uh, parallel programming challenges that cannot be efficiently handled by existing system. And the very first challenge we want to overcome is transparency. Okay? So let's take a look at a hello world example in our system. Suppose you want to do four things, okay? A, B, C, D. A has to run before B and C. D has to run after B and C. Okay? Well, each task represents a function or a task. In terms of task flow, this is all you need. Only 15 lines of C++ code to get a power execution for this task graph. So first you will need to create a task flow object. Let me see if I can use my point over here. And then you will create an executor to perform the scheduling. From the task flow, you can use in place to insert uh, several tasks in terms of C++ lambda function object like A, B, C, D over here and use the precede method to relate, relate the dependency between A, B, C, and D. And finally, you can submit the task flow to the executor and it will perform all the scheduling for you. So at this moment, I believe most of you can fully understand what this code is doing. That's the power of transparency and expressiveness. 
Another major innovation of our task flow when you compare with existing system is our control task flow graph programming model or CTFG. Uh, CTFG goes beyond the limitation of traditional deck based model that does not allow you to express control flow in a single graph entity. For a complicated workload like this example over here where you have a cycle uh, to describe iterative control flow, conditional tasking or even a loop, it becomes almost impossible for existing DAC based system to express a very efficient overlap between control flow and your task. So this is our heterogeneous tasking interface. Uh, we have been using CUDA and SQL, so you can write a single source C++ program and then it will be compiled to run on multiple accelerators like FPGA, CPU, uh, GPU, and so on and so forth. And the programming model is pretty much similar to what you are familiar with the CPU-based model. Uh, in this example over here, we have four data transfer costs and then a data transfer a task and then also one kernel task to perform the power iteration. And you can describe everything in a very similar uh, fashion to our CPU-based model. Using task flow is very, very easy. Um, pretty much all you need is just include our task flow project into your, uh, into your project and you tell your compiler where to find a header file because task flow is header file only. Uh, it's completely written in standard C++. There is no non-standard C++ feature. All you need is to download our header file, include it into your project, tell compiler where to find it, that's it. Everything by default can be visualized. If you want to run your task flow program with the visualization result, you just need to enable an environment variable telling the operating system how to dump your execution timeline into the JSON file. Then you can copy and paste the JSON into a browser-based interface to visualize the execution result of your program. And everything is built in by default. We have successfully applied our system to many EDA applications. Uh, one of the most important applications we apply is our open timer project. Um, if you look at timing analysis, of course, is a very important uh, step in the overall design flow because it helps you verify the expected timing behavior. So if you look at what existing work do, they typically will levelize your graph and perform level by level propagation and use pipeline to parallelize the propagation. But with task flow, we are able to model the entire timing propagation in a big task flow graph. So we can flow the computation uh, very naturally and more asynchronously across your circuit network, including many in-graph control flow tasks. So we can prune unnecessary propagation on the fly. So this is the sample result that shows you with task flow, we are able to achieve uh, over 600 speed up. And of course, that is also part of the reason by using GPU. Uh, over the baseline with one CPU and uh, with 40 CPU, uh, our solution can also be 44x faster. Everything is composable and is unified in our system. Task dependency control flow, they are all associated with each other. So you can represent a very generic control task flow graph and to achieve end-to-end -end power reason. And for example, there is a pause on Reddit uh, sharing how task flow help their company uh, migrate the existing multimedia engine to the parallel target in just a few hours and the performance got about 8%. So right now it is open source and we do have quite a lot of people using that. Uh, some of them are company. Uh, for example, I recently gave a talk to Zydings at AMD. Uh, their Vivado synthesis uh, place and route engine is already using Taskflow. Okay, I believe I'm going to stop here. If you want to understand more details about our system, feel free to check out our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, TW. So, um, nice Hi. picture, by the way. So, um, questions? Yes. So, uh, in your examples, you specify the precedence manually so that A as to C, B and B as to C, or something like that. But if, uh, are you also able to figure out that figure out from data dependencies, or is that out of scope? So the question is about data dependency. And in our system, we do not handle data dependency. It is completely up to application developer. 
This is one of the probably one of the biggest lessons we have learned when we try to start initiate this project because the way you want to optimize memory managed data is typically application dependent. So we do not provide yet another abstraction over data, but we just focus on how to describe your workload in terms of task graph and then we schedule that for you. And of course you can always describe your data dependency in terms of task dependency. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. More questions. Uh, are there opportunities in any of the algorithms you look at for overlapping between data, streaming data between tasks? That's a very good question. Uh, yes, we do have a very specialized scheduler uh, trying to maximize the overlap between your tasks and data movement uh, as much as possible. Yeah. But that will be a totally different topic uh, related to scheduler. Thank you. More questions? Uh, my question would be, how, how does this language compare or approach to, to other domain-specific language for data or control data flow, such as I don't the actor language, because it looks very much like actors you connect in your main program and, and the, its behavior, or do you have to provide any analysis with this? Uh, dynamic or static data flow uh, because they are domain specific also analysis for such restricted data flow models of computation that have you to dimension memory buffer yes, yes. Are, uh, work has been done in this area. Um, actually my short answer to this is no uh, like I say we primarily focus on how we can task you know describe a task flow graph and we can do the <laughs> scheduling for you and the reason why we do not want to come up with another domain-specific knowledge is the ecosystem. Because a lot of time when you come up with a domain-specific language, the biggest challenge you, is you have to convince the community, convince the people to either rewrite their application using your language or they will start to question about the sustainability of that particular language. So that is the biggest challenge that. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. So Taskflow is completely written in standard C++. Uh, like I said, there is no non-standard C++ feature. So it's fairly easy to use and integrate into your project. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So it's time for me uh, to introduce uh, Tim Edwards. It's a big honor that he has made it uh, today to our workshop. He, uh, I guess, is most famous for uh, his work on Qflow. Uh, he's with um, eFabless and Open Circuit Design, and today he's going to present Caravan. So welcome, Tim. Okay. Thank you. So if, if you don't know who I am, then uh, you may not be in the VLSI domain. You can, you can Google who I am. Uh, so uh, I'd say half of VLSI talks include a graph of Moore's Law. This is my slide of Moore's Law. The, the reason I wanted to show it is because uh, Moore's Law represents the fact that uh, the design in VLSI has been performance driven, just completely, totally performance driven. And of course, being performance driven, that comes at a cost, a literal cost. And the cost of making a mask set for any process, <clears throat> somewhere around 65 nanometers that exceeded the median cost of a house in the US. I, I like to use that as a reference. And of course, people who are doing prototyping designs don't have to pay for the mask cost, but the mask cost has to be paid by somebody. And so even if you distribute that cost over a number of projects in an MPW, it's still expensive and it's still out of the price range for a hobbyist, for instance. Uh, if you want to do something useful, like over here, this is our Caravel chip from eFabless. The core processor of that is a very small CPU. That's about the minimum size of something useful you can do. And it's still two millimeters squared in a 130 nanometer process. And so that's still in the cost of thousands of dollars. So the cost, the point is that the cost 
is not just the cost of the silicon, it's also the cost of failure if your thing doesn't work. Uh, and the, the thing is that standard design processes essentially assume that you have a PDK with essentially perfect data. And that's because foundry data for established nodes has come from PDKs that are, I mean, they're generating PDKs that are generally reliable. That's because they have done this over numerous iterations of silicon. And that's what they give to you when you buy a proprietary PDK. So the traditional design uh, methodologies all assume this idea that your data is perfect. And so all you do is you uh, test your design over process corners, over PVT. Uh, and if that works, you're good. And if it doesn't work, you might try doing Monte Carlo simulation, which is a little easier to meet. And if that works, you're good. And that sets your probability bounds that you're going to get first time working silicon. Now the problem is you get an open source PDK. You throw an open source PDK into the mix and now the trust in that PDK goes way down. The reason is the open PDK has been pulled from many, many sources and some of the data sources, uh, I, I've been involved in the open sourcing of the Skywater process. And the problem with that was we get all these data formats. Some of them are pr pr proprietary, so we can't use them. Uh, and so we pull data from wherever we can find it in the files that the foundry sent to us. And in some cases, we find that those, uh, those files don't even have the right data because they weren't part of the commercial flow. They were just some other file format and nobody paid attention to what was in that file. And so you find it's completely broken. So until we have many more measurements of on open source silicon, if you're starting with any new project, then you will need to rely on assorted tools and methods that are in the public domain. Now, there are two approaches to this. You can make your data, try to get your data better, uh, or you can try to design against the data, which is why I call this principles of paranoid design. So for the first part of that, how do you make your data better? So one of the things that commercial tools have that has not been in the open source world until recently is the idea that you can use a field equation solver uh, to figure out what all the parasitics are for your process. Because that is one of the main areas where the data is often not very reliable. Uh, so I have found this, uh, this is from fastfieldsolvers.com. It's an open source field equation solver called FasterCap. It has 3D and 2D solvers. And I wrote a, uh, a little project that I put up on GitHub. I'll show the URL for that in the next slide. But essentially it's a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of an API and a bunch of routines written in Python that will take a file that describes a process like Skywater 130, for instance, or GF 180, uh, and then build out a number of different metal structures in a faster cap input format, then make like a hundred of those, thousands of those, and then run them through faster cap. And from that, I've been able to get all these curve traces for how the uh, parasitic capacitances work in this process and use that then to go improve all the models that I have in my layout program Magic, which does extraction. And uh, I'm getting much better results than I have before using this. And it's also extensible, so if any time we need to onboard another project, uh, another foundry process, then it's just a matter of writing an input file and then we can redo these and get all the coefficients that goes plugs back into magic and you get your parasitic extraction. So uh, right now I have what I consider to be a pretty good uh, full RC extraction in magic. And uh, this is an example of me running full RC extraction and then simulating on a uh, open RAM circuit that Matt sent me. And you can see the difference between in this uh, section here where it's being driven back to mid-range voltage that in an ideal simulation, it goes directly down to the mid-range voltage and a full RC extracted, it's got a slope to it. And you, uh, somewhere else in the simulation, you can see where a bit fails because of that. 
Uh, at the same time, we've got tools like the, the simulators themselves, ng-spice and Zeiss. ng-spice has recently introduced uh, OSVI and OpenVF compilers, which you can run as plugins. That makes it a lot easier for us to use some of the newer models. We have, for instance, a few uh, Verilog A models and Skywater process that we weren't able to introduce with the original release of the OpenPDK uh, that we can do now. And that all, that's also true of the RERAM models in Sky 130. And then Zeiss has been doing a lot of uh, development also in the last few years and is getting much more compatible with other versions of Spice. So now the, the other approach is rather than try to make your data more reliable, try to design for making something robust rather than designing for performance, performance, performance. Uh, so I, you know, the, the principle here is that if you are designing to an open PDK and the open PDK has only recently been introduced, then you should not be trying to design something for performance. You should be designing uh, for something interesting, for novel architecture, and you should be trying to make the thing work. So design for robustness and be paranoid about your design. Most of the design methodologies to make things robust are not new. They're, some of these things are pretty old, uh, and some of them have been entirely forgotten because of this push for performance. So one thing you can do, for instance, if you want a robust circuit, robust digital circuit, is just to do two-phase clocking, in which you take a flop, you divide it in half instead of clocking one on the rising clock edge and the other half on the falling clock edge, you clock them on two, uh, two phases of a non-overlapping clock. And so if your circuit has setup problems, you can just slow down the clock. If your circuit has hold problems, you can increase the spacing between the clocks. And one way or the other, you will get it to work. It won't be the best performance, but it will work. And I think most uh, synthesis place and route tools should be able to work with this style. Uh, it's just a matter of routing two different clock networks. They're not going to do it optimally, uh, and that's going to have a performance impact, but they should be able to do it. For anybody who's been through the first couple of open MPWs, we had problems. That problem was due specifically to me not paying attention to what I just said, which is to not trust the data. Uh, so if you have something like a, a serial chain up top, the standard way to solve for making sure that your clock doesn't arrive before your data is to delay the clock by inserting uh, delays into it. The tools will do that automatically. In our case, this was in a hierarchy. I was doing it manually. I trusted the data. Uh, I put in some extra delays. It wasn't enough. And we got whole violations in the scan chain. Now, there are several things I could have done that would have made it more robust. One of them is just to run your clock backwards through the scan chain. Uh, I had not wanted to do that because I was adding several wires up the side, which uh, I was trying to avoid taking out area that I would otherwise be giving to the users for the user project area. This is in the, the Caravel harness chip. Uh, but eventually we realized, oh, you can just do on the bottom, you just uh, clock things on the negative clock edge and it will be uh, always correct. Uh, and we have some users who have done that. Our paranoid users are our most successful users, going back to what I said on the first slide. Uh, you can also do this for, for instance, uh, an entire subsystem like the uh, Wishbone interface. This was uh, suggested by Tobias Strauch, in which you can design the user area so that it is picking up the Wishbone clock and clocking, on the negative clocking data on the negative edge of that clock. And as long as you've designed your wishbone interface on the user side for that, then it, it will work. And we had another paranoid user who decided that he didn't know the relationship between the clock and data between the uh, microcontroller and the user project. So he figured that he would just put in a delay chain and then select from the delay chain. You can select whatever delay of clock you want. And he found one that worked, and he was the first person to get up a full user project that was a complete microcontroller uh, in the user project area. So um, that's all I had for my story, and thank you for listening. And we now have a little time, I guess, for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Tim. So, questions?
Thank you. So it's just a feedback for the community. A lot of the links that goes to these PDKs are broken. So you go there and there is nothing, uh, basically. For example, it, it takes you to the website, like it does, but it's not there, or the conversion. It's a bit complex and confusing to find things. I don't know if you can get back to the people of the community to do the model. Well, like, yeah, like all open source stuff, it depends on feedback to fix. And uh, I'm not sure which links you're specifically referring to, but uh, coming from where? So uh, go from e-tablets to read dumps or some e So you go there, or I think I don't remember exactly where it is, but the links are broken. So basically, some of the not on the um, yeah, I, I do know that there are issues with, with some of the links there, and again, feedback is, is what we need. <laughs> we, we do have a Slack channel where we're fairly responsive to those things. Uh, question. Oh, right How do you see the problems with data quality um, changing as we go down, for example, the smaller nodes, if we're lucky enough to have open PDKs on those nodes? Uh, it depends. It will get worse to a point. Uh, I understand that once you get to FinFETs, you end up having... Uh, Andrew is suddenly shaking his head, so I'm probably about to say something that is... Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah, yeah, once you get to FinFETs, you have very uh, a lot of constraints, and there are so many constraints that it actually makes design problems uh, easier in some cases. Uh, so it's possible that once you get to FinFETs, the problem just becomes a little easier. But, uh, but yeah, certainly down to 65, 45 nanometers, to, all, all the way down to 28. 28 is probably the worst. So. <laughs> Um, and we're getting there. And I don't expect to get open source PDKs down in that range anytime soon. The caveat is, or the comment is that um, it was a big struggle with the provenance of Skywater 130 coming from an IBM. But if a commercial pure play node is open source, it will almost from the get go be much more complete and robust and qualified. So that would be quite like easier in the future. Of course, yeah, there are certain levels of trust that are dependent on the level of trust in the foundry to begin with and the process that's being done. Yeah, oh, uh, Skywater particularly is sort of researchy in the way they do things, uh, and that makes it a little less trustable than some of the other foundries. But then they're also easier to work with and have been the only one so far, uh, followed by GF then, to become open source. More questions? Okay, so we have a perfect timing. So thanks again, Tim. And our next speaker is uh, Nikhil Nikhil. Uh, Nikhil is founder and uh, co founder and CTO of Bluespec. And today uh, he will talk about uh, high level HDL. And yeah, so please, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the BlueSpec high-level design languages. I would guess that most people might have heard the name BlueSpec, but perhaps don't know very much about it at all, other than having heard the name. There's also a small uh, terminological confusion in that there's a BlueSpec company and there's the BlueSpec languages. They, were, they used to be the same at one point, but uh, the BlueSpec language has been open sourced completely for about three years now. And the BlueSpec company is not directly involved in BlueSpec language anything uh, other than allowing people like me to work on it <laughs> and giving me resources for that. So I'd like to uh, talk about, uh, just give you a sense of what the language is about. It's yet another high level design language. Many of you will be saying, so what's different? And uh, there are many dimensions of differences between different other HDLs, but I think the one fairly unique one in the sense that I've not seen any other HDL that takes this approach is the semantic model of uh, condition action rules, which is inspired by languages in formal verification. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to mostly spend my time on that. There's also a different dimension, which is 
how it borrows lots of ideas from Haskell for static elaboration, etc. But we don't have enough time to go into both of these things, so I'm just going to focus on this thing, which is fairly, fairly, fairly unique. So I'll, I'll do it by means of a small example. So I'm, what blue spec the language is is been inspired by right from the beginning for, by uh, languages for formal specification of highly concurrent systems. Um, so. Uh, I'll, I'll start by giving a small example. Just imagine a very small toy coherent cache system. So in this example, uh, L2 is your L2 cache. We have two L1 caches, A and B. And uh, we have FIFOs that are do read-write requests from, let's say, from two CPUs into the L1 caches. And they may be coming concurrently into those CPUs, all right? So let's imagine this is the initial state of the system where uh, a had L1A has the data X in exclusive mode. Maybe it recently did a write onto the data. Um, it's invalid in L1B, and L2 says just has a notation that it's available in exclusive mode in in A, and perhaps has an old value Y in it. And now imagine a read request comes in to B. So we can imagine transitioning to a state like this, where the states have all become shared. The current value X is available everywhere, and L2 has a notation that it's available at both A and B. Once we have it in the state, seeing a read on B, we can immediately satisfy the read and, and put back an X. So what I've shown you in a picture can be expressed um, in text as a rule, a condition action rule. So this rule says, if the request on B at the head is a read, its state is invalid, and L2 is exclusive, then here are some updates to the state that will uh, transition the L1, L, L2s, L and re respond with uh, to B with the value X. In it. So this, essentially the entire behavior of the cache can be specified. So this is, I'm not claiming this is an implementation, but you can specify the cache behavior using rules like this. So for example, I'd have a similar rule if, if the request was a write, and similarly a pair of rules for reads and writes on A, right? And the nice thing about rules is that they are concurrent in the sense that if rules don't interfere in any way, they can run concurrently. There's no ordering between rules. Uh, you can non-deterministically choose what order you execute rules on if you want to pick an order. Um, the only thing you need to, that is important, is that rules should be treated as atomic transactions. And why atomic transactions? Because we want to think in terms of invariance for correctness on the overall cache system. And invariant may be a correctness condition like if uh, one of the L1s is in exclusive mode, then the other one must be invalid, for example. Right? And you want to check, so with rules, you can reason about that if the invariant was true before the rule, after this rule, is it still true? And atomicity gives you the tool exactly to do, to do that kind of reasoning. So here's the second version of the same problem, except I'm going to write it with much finer granularity rules, right? So start with the same state. And now my rules are going to be local. In other words, every rule is only going to look at one of the elements of, those, of the cache system. And it can send and receive messages. So when we see this initial state, we send a shared request to L2, and we go into a pending mode on B. When L2 sees the shared request, it sends a downgrade request up to L1A, saying, please get back into shared mode. And it also goes into pending mode. When that sees the shared thing, it goes into shared state, returns a shared response, and says, here's the new value x. When the L2 gets that, it goes into shared mode and sends uh, acknowledgement back to B saying, okay, you're shared. And, uh, and finally, B itself can go into shared mode. And now we're just like in the second state that you saw in the previous slide, and we can respond with an X. So this is much more closer to the implementation because it's local. I'm not looking at state all over the system as if I can instantaneously look at state. I'm, I'm accom accommodating the idea that there's a cost to be paid by uh, communication. Now this whole thing could also be written in exactly the same syntax, the same notation language, except that every rule now, if you look at it in detail, I've, I've just given about three or four of these rules, 
is is uh, is is set up to be uh, a local trans uh, examination of your current local state and incoming messages, and tra the transition is the local change in state and outgoing messages. So this is not a new idea. In general, the idea of condition action rules it goes back to perhaps the earliest days of Lisp programming in the 50s and 60s. Uh, uh, I've mentioned some formal, formal specification systems, TLA plus, Unity, uh, term rewriting systems, event B, etc. that all use modulo different syntaxes and details, roughly the same idea. You have condition action rules, rules are not ordered, they can go in any order, so they give you concurrency, they're non-deterministic, you can choose them in any order you like, and the only thing is they all assume rules are uh, atomic. So. Uh, and further, the other nice thing about having the single language is you can refine, right? In my first slide and my second slide, I show you this the solution to the same cash course problem with rules at different granularity, where in some sense you're lowering it down closer to the implementation. So, given that background, let me now tell you a little bit about BSV and BH, these languages. So essentially, that the syntax and language I showed you in the first two slides is actual BSV code. I can push a button, run it through the BSV compiler, and get synthesizable RTL out of it. So, uh, and that RTL, then you take it through standard RTL flows, uh, FPGA, or, or, or AC. And essentially, all behavior is written in this way, as in these formal specification languages. There is no other behavioral uh, description other than this rule notation. Right? So we have two such languages for historical reasons. The original compiler 20 years ago, when we first started it, was written by Haskell enthusiasts, had a very Haskell-like syntax, didn't go very well in the hardware engineering community, so we redesigned the syntax to be a more system very logish syntax, so that's called BSV. Uh, but essentially it's the same language, your choice of front end, and you can mix and match, uh, mix and match them. So, it's, so this is not a new language, as I said, it's newly open sourced. Uh, it's been about 20 years in the making. So this is not a research language, this is not a toy language we're experimenting with. We're using this and it has been used a lot in production uh, in, in, in many, many situations. And being of that provenance of that much time, uh, it's, it's a so-called batteries included language. In other words, there's lots and lots of libraries available so that you don't design every little piece of IP from scratch, whether it's caches or MMUs or RISC-V CPUs or uh, debug controllers, interrupt controllers, AXI buses, all of these are available as open source libraries so that you can sort of focus more on the architecture of something that you might be designing uh, rather than uh, having to build everything up from scratch. So it's been used, uh, it, like I said, it was a proprietary tool from the company for 15, like 16 years, during which time it was used for ASIC design in ST and in TI for some rather large subsystems. It was used for modeling in IBM and other places uh, because the, the, the nice fact about, the, 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 the fact that you have the same notation, whether you're no matter what level of abstraction you're describing it at, means you can actually compile and synthesize even the higher description. So even the thing I showed you in the first slide, which was unrealistic from uh, implementation point of view, if you're looking for performance, is still compilable to RTL and you can still pr produce an RTL. You can run it on FPGAs as is. Even the specification can be run on FPGAs. So IBM recognizing that was using this as a modeling tool to explore microarchitectures for some of their power CPUs, etc., back in the 2000s. So uh, nowadays, I would say it's mostly used by people for FPGA uh, programming. A lot of it in the in the in the RISC-V space. So it's been open sourced, like I said, in about uh, three years ago. And uh, so that I hope that gives you a quick uh, sense of the. Uh, um, What's uh, what's in blue spec? So this is a unique feature. You'll see other languages, for example, like Chisel has exploited Scala for um, high-level expression of RTL, if you like, because it generates RTL from that. Uh, but this is the only language I'm aware of that uses this 
idea of condition action rules as the behavioral spec and like I said the whole inspiration has been for formal verification. Uh, we and the company haven't used it. First of all, I'd like to say that even, even if you're not using formal verification as part of your automation, the idea that it has a formal semantics and has a formal way of doing refinement is useful even if you're doing it in manually. And most of what we have done is in fact been done manually. The automation work, there's a bunch of work at MIT where they have done uh, pretty advanced risk 5 superscalar out of order speculative processors and proved them correct using, using BlueSpec. Um, and uh, we are in the process of doing some DARPA related projects also uh, along, along, along these lines. So uh, I'll stop at that point with this main point, uh, just as a teaser, it's in the slide so you can see it later on. Uh, it's too much to look at at this point. Uh, but the other side of blue spec is that it uses essentially all the power of Haskell, including polymorphic types, polymorphic parameters, high order functions, etc., to make it into a very powerful language for circuit description. So if you think of generating your circuit as two phases, the static elaboration part in some sense is the circuit description part by which you describe what's the structure of your circuit, what are the pieces, what, are, what connects to what, and how do they connect correctly from a type's point of view to each other. And then there's the behavioral part. So the condition action rules is about the behavioral side of, of blue spec. And there's also a whole chapter on uh, the, the Haskell based uh, static elaboration, which you can talk to me about separately outside or later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? So I'm obviously it's a very good decision. I'm always interested in hearing like the reasoning behind these things. I'm just curious why your company decided to make um, the BlueSpec compiler open source. I'm always interested in knowing yeah, why people do this. Yeah. Things. So. Uh, so we essentially gave up <laughs> on, on trying to commercialize this. We, we, we tried it for more than a decade. And I think the, what, what I find is that if you, if you look at similar experience in software languages, open source languages succeed. Uh, open source languages themselves might succeed if you have, you have enough oomph in them, let's say Python, for example. Or even if it's not an open source language, it might succeed if you have a big name and big resources behind it. So I ex pointed Java, for example, right? Java, why did people adopt Java? Well, um, you know, Sun Microsystems was behind it. And why do people adopt C Sharp and F Sharp? Microsoft is behind it. Uh, so we, we can't compete in that space. We're not a big company like it. So unless we got acquired by one of the biggies and one of the biggies took, uh, pr promoted it, then it would take off, but it, it, it didn't. So we gave up eventually. We, we found over time also that a lot of our uh, activities in the company, up, you know, drifted more into services and IP and things like that, for which we use BlueSpec for everything we do, the language. But uh, as a EDA tool, uh, we just gave up on that. Thank you, Hans. Yes. Uh, so this is a very different execution model from what we're used to, right? Uh, I can very much say I was used to for for the describing caches and CPUs and stuff, but is there, are there things that you tried to design with it where the execution model has been a limitation, I guess? I don't think so. So I think both for so this raises an interesting question. One, one a related question other people ask you, it was not your question, was uh, how does this compare with HLS, for example, right? So one interesting thing is that the way, one separation I make is that if, uh, whether you take Verilog, VHDL, System Verilog, Chisel, BlueSpec, you, the designer, are completely, ultimately choosing the microarchitecture of what you do. There is no guesswork. The tool is not making any innovation except local combinatorial optimizations and all. Generally, the overall structure of what you're doing is designer specified, whereas in HLS, the tool is has uh, an architecture and it has knobs by which you can adjust details of that architecture by and large. So that's one, one major difference. So, 
So we, we sit very much in the Verilog system, Verilog chisel, that, that camp, as opposed to HLS. Then to, coming back to your question then is, uh, if you think all of these languages, Verilog system, Verilog VHDL and chisel, they all use the classical clock uh, synchronous circuit model as their, effectively their behavioral model on top of it, right? And here we are lifting it up beyond that to the rule-based model. I didn't say anything about clocks in any of my description out here. So there is a question of how you synthesize from there into, a, because ultimately we produce standard clock synthesizer parallel. And ultimately it comes down to scalability in your reasoning about correctness, right? I think for small circuits it doesn't make much of a difference whether you use the conventional Verilog system Verilog or respect. But the thing about this atomicity is it's a global property. In other words, uh, the, if the way in, in a blue spec program, you can have a module that has rules, that rule might invoke a method that crosses the boundary of the module into another module, which you can think of the method as a piece of a rule that's extending, and that may transitively go beyond that to multiple modules. And it's in that kind of a situation where atomicity becomes a nightmare if you have to think about every level, level of detail of arbitration of every possible con interference, especially when there's a lot of conditional in interference. That is, on some conditions it interferes, in other conditions it doesn't, etc. So that is where the value of having this atomic transaction model uh, really helps in, in, in quickly composing scalable systems that uh, that have a lot of this kind of thing. It's definitely a big advantage on uh, circuits that have a lot of control flow in them because that is where the conditional interference, et cetera, becomes uh, most, uh, most uh, prominent. If you have a very much of a data path, you know, what the kind of thing that HLS does well on loops and arrays and all that, I don't think BlueSpec will give you much of an advantage on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. One point, ages ago, I think, uh, there were fashionable discussions of uh, self timed logic and systolic operation. Is this so, good question. So, the question was about self timing logic and asynchronous logic and things like that. And again, Caltech was, of course, uh, very prominent in that. It's, that's a very interesting question because. Rules, as I gave you, didn't say anything about clocks, and it seems like a natural fit for asynchronous logic, self-timing logic, etc. Uh, it's a topic to be somebody should explore. <laughs> it's it's the kind of thing where uh, we've always had this uh, idea that it could be targeted towards asynchronous logic. There was a company called Acronix that was doing asynchronous logic-based FPGAs. Uh, that we had some conversations with, etc. We just didn't have the bandwidth to explore that per se, but absolutely, it could be the same rule-based source language could, instead of our synthesis method that goes through into clock very long, could have gone into asynchronous logic as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Hans Kamer. Uh, he submitted his work to OSTA. So um, Hans is a PhD student at Lincoln University from Sweden. And today he will um, uh, tell you more about an HDL in developed uh, Spain. Please. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Franz, I'm uh, going to talk about Spade, and of course we need to motivate uh, things. So uh, my motivation is very much in line with <laughs> the answer to my question. It's abstraction, and to me this is sort of saying what things we have to think about and what things we are in control over. Um, so as an example, you might have, you have Verilog and VHDL. They are going to be low level in almost any way you look at them, but you can do low level Verilog and sort of instantiate individual AND gates in an at list or do high level Verilog doing more behavioral description and reasoning about sort of individual operations on individual bundles of bits. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have high level synthesis. Here we've given up a whole lot of control, um, but we also have way less things to think about. Now, Spade is absolutely not a high-level synthesis tool. Uh, just like BlueSpec, it falls uh, on the lower uh, end side of the spectrum. 
And the goal with everything I'm trying to do here is to retain the control that you have with Verilog and, and VHDL, but push the amount of high-level reasoning you can do while still retaining that control. Um, so first of all, I want to give a... All right, I also want to steal a bunch of stuff from software languages, because I'm a software developer, and I miss a lot of things when I come to Verilog and VHDL and other HDLs. So, uh, I want to start off with an example of what the, the language looks like. Uh, this is sort of the hello world, a counter that counts from some value or from zero up to some maximum value. Um, the inputs are separated from the outputs, so yeah, here we take a clock, a reset, and a max value, and this thing produces a, a current counter value. And the whole language is more linear than Verilog and VHDL, for better or for worse. Uh, but I think it's re easier to reason about things in a linear way and then explicitly do non-linear uh, flow of data, I suppose. Um, to define a counter, we need a register. Uh, we call that register val, and we clock it by this uh, CLK signal. Um, the re register statement is the only uh, only sequential statement in the language, everything else is combinational. Um, we specify a reset, so if the RSD signal is uh, true, then we set it to zero. And then to describe the behavior of the circuit, we give a new value of the register as a function of the old values. So if the, uh, value, the current value is at the max value, the new value will be set to zero, otherwise it will be the, uh, the old value incremented by one. Um, some key takeaways here. Uh, first of all, it's an expression-based language. So instead of saying, if val is max, set val to zero, we say val is the result of this if statement, and then we have to specify a value in each branch. And that prevents a few bugs, and once you get used to it, I think it's a more natural mapping to hardware than the imperative style that most HDLs have. Uh, it's a statically typed language, so we specify all the types. Um, it also tries to make sure that you don't accidentally throw away information that you might need. So if you do val plus one, that could overflow, so the language will not allow you to throw away that overflow implicitly. You have to call this trunk function to say that, no, I actually do want to throw away a bit here, since we have a uh, feedback in the circuit. Uh, it has type inference, so you don't have to specify any types inside the body. The, the compiler figures them out for you. Um, as long as things are fine. If, they, if the compiler finds some inconsistency, then it will, of course, alert you. So you get the benefits of static types without the uh, annoying typing. And unlike BlueSpec, this is a cycle-to-cycle -cycle description of your hardware. You give the new value of all the registers as a function of the old value of all the registers, but you have a lot more structured tools for doing this than you do in Verilog and VHDL. Um, one of those tools that you have access to is a pipelining feature. So on the left here, you have some code. On the right, we have the resulting hardware. The thing I want you to pay attention to is these three lines. So first of all, the head of the pipeline specifies its latency. Um, so just by reading the head, you can now see that the delay between input and output in this module is going to be two. Then you have the two rig statements, um, which Specify that all the variables above a rig statement should now be registered, and when you refer to those variables below the rig statement, refer to the register version. And this decouples the description of where you put pipeline registers from the computation that you're performing inside the circuit. This is useful when you're describing the circuit originally, but it's way more useful when you have to refactor things. So let's say we, uh, want, we realize that this G block at the top is too slow. Um, it's breaking our fmax, so we need to optimize it. And we do that by pipelining it. Um, and normally, you would have to do a bunch of thinking now, like, what do I have to change because of this? In Spade, because the compiler knows about pipelines, it will first tell you that, hey, you first need to instantiate this g-block as a pipeline. Uh, and you specify the depth there, so if there was more complex behavior here, the user would need to go back and check that, OK, there is no either change the circuit to match a new description or, or um, uh, yeah. If the, uh, in this case, the compiler will actually figure out the problem for us. We have this line going backwards through the pipeline. The behavior of, behavior of our circuit changed. So the compiler will tell us that this X value is not available where you're trying to use it. You need to use it in a later stage. Of course, the solution here is to delay the computation of this whole pipeline one cycle. So we insert these two registers 
these two new registers into the pipeline. And because I, we get decoupled the description of pipelining from the description of the computation, the only change we have to make is to put reg there and update the depth of the outer pipeline because now that changed the latency of the pipeline. Um, this pipelining feature has a few more things that I don't have time to go into. Um, you can do feedback and bypasses, so you can, reason, you can say, I want to refer to the value of this register uh, two cycles ago or two cycles in the, or in the value as it appears in two, uh, two stages below me, for example. This is very useful if you're doing something like a processor where you have a register file that is sort of uh, feedbacks on itself. You can also do, as of a few weeks ago, you can do, um, there's some built-in support for dynamic behavior. So you can say that all of the stages here should, or all the pipeline registers in this stage should stall if a condition holds, and then it will stall all the pipeline stages above this. Um, and this allows you to do correct flushing, and there's almost enough support in the language now for doing back pressure negotiation between the pipelines, so you can um, solve that as well in a structured manner. That's the uh, pipelining construct. Um, another, one of the things I wanted to steal from software languages was the type system. So um, one of the major things I miss in uh, a lot of languages that don't have this is the enum, uh, and the more powerful enum in the Rust sense rather than the enum of C where it's just one of a set of values. Uh, the type system supports generics, so we define a type here called option, and it's going to be generic over any type T. We could put integers in there, we could put structs in there, other enums, uh, whatever we feel like. You can, um, this, value, this option type will take on one of two values. Either it's sum, in which case a value is present, or it could be none, in which case no value is present. The best way to view this to me is as a Read a valid bit that is bundled with the data it validates. So the representation of this type will be a tag along with a value. If the tag is zero, the option type is none, and the value bits are undefined. And we're not going to be allowed to access these bits unless we first check that the tag is one, in which case the compiler will give us access to the bits. So this prevents reading data that wasn't really valid. Um, this is very useful for a lot of other things as well. Um, you could model commands on a bus. For example, the, uh, if you have a memory, you could have no operation on the menu, memory, you could have a read operation, or you could have a write operation, and you can bundle the data that it needs. You can model a, an instruction set. So you have a set instruction where you have a destination register and an immediate value. You have an add instruction where you have a destination register and two, uh, register, two input registers or you can have a jump instruction, which is a target. And this will be encoded in a similar way. And it's very nice to match on these, and then you only get access to the fields of your instruction that you actually have a use for. Um, finally, uh, tooling. I think tooling is a very important part of any language. Um, I showed briefly the compiler error message. That's something I'm very passionate about. The compiler should give you useful error messages that describe what you need to change to make things work. Um, so any bad error, any unclear compiler error message I can see through a bug. We have a, uh, we have test patches in CocoaDB, um, and CocoaDB is a Python testing framework for Verilog. The thing that Spade appends to it is the ability to write Spade code inside CocoaDB. So you can write a string with a Spade expression, it goes out to the compiler, compiles it, and that way you don't have to care how the compiler decided to encode your enum or your struct. And there's a build too. So it can manage dependencies. Here I say I want a RISC-V implementation and a from a path and a RGB-led driver from some Git repo. It can call build tools for you. So um, Yoast is an XPNR. And it's scriptable via plugins. So this specifies that I want to bring in a plugin that generates a program memory for an assembly file, from an assembly file. Um, the last slide, uh, Spade is an open source project, of course this is OSDA, it's implemented in Rust, uh, but it's not using any of the Rust compiler, it's not embedded inside Rust, it is a standard on language, it's just that I take a lot of inspiration from it and implemented it, the compiler in Rust. Um, it's targeting Verilog, which is not great, it's easy to do and all the tools support it, so that's why I decided to do it. Um, but I would like to explore something else like Circuit, Calyx, or RTLIL because that would give me a whole lot more uh, nice features. 
that's all I have to say. Uh, if you want to learn more, there's a website, spadelang.org, or you can follow me on Mastodon, where I ramble about this language. Very good. Thank you very much, Hans. So, questions? Yeah, um, for Chisel, I actually have a slide because I get asked this question a lot. Um, so, of course, Spade is a new language. It's Chisel and all the other languages are going to way more mature, be way more mature. I would say all of the languages kind of push the abstraction level, but Chisel in particular and, well, I guess Chisel and all the other sort of hardware construction languages, as I think they call them, um, they do so by doing metaprogramming. But when you when you when you can't use metaprogramming, when you're describing the individual sort of operations that you want to perform, you're still doing sort of bundles of bits and individual operations on those bundles of bits. So there's no pipelining feature because it's just bundles of bits. You don't have any nice types at the hardware level. You don't have this pattern matching that you can do on the enums. I didn't show that off due to time, but um, and they're also imperative. So I think you have this, if this happens, set this, which I think is sort of the wrong way to view hardware. And they're also embedded languages. So they, to me, they feel kind of clunky. You have to do when, else, when, otherwise, instead of if, else, which is fine, but then the auto formatter kind of messes with it when you do that. Um, and yeah, there's some other stuff as well. You can read the points on the slide, but I, I hope that answers the question. You asked about LaTeX as well? Or? Which is in the same yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you give us an example of what uh, you or others have designed with this? Sure, yeah. So um, it's kind of early stages still. I have a, a working RISC V uh, processor, a five stage pipeline thing that is, it only supports the base instruction set for now. Um, I've built um, the controller for uh, a research project I'm working on, which is sort of doing dynamic programming. So it's feeding a bunch of stuff into a long pipeline and then and writing the results back to memories. Um, I'm playing around with uh, talking to SDRAM now. Um, so I, I've, uh, for that I realized that I don't really want to write a SDRAM controller right now. So then it's more like, can I integrate light DRAM with spade in a nice way um, and some random games I, a few friends of mine and I built a, a game during a game jam so I've used uh, I guess the MyJet which is the older version of Amaran yep. a lot mm -hmm. and uh, I can test uh, your work because I spend hours just missing time trying to figure out I, I think I've learned issues yep. so I, I do it on time nice thanks <laughs> I've, uh, I've had lots of fun with this project. I started it like two years ago um, as a hobby project and then it turned into a work project and they still find it super fun to work on. So um, it's a fun challenge. It's nice to have things to like borrow from. W with your typing thing, uh, a thing that isn't a thing in software but is a thing in hardware is like modeling ports. So I didn't get into that here, but I have a system for similar to the lifetimes in Rust, but for modeling so that you can only use a memory port, for example, once. If you try to give a memory port to two different independent circuits, the compiler would say, like, no, it's being used twice. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, that seems to me going a bit heavy on the, on the Rust side. Um, <laughs> I, I, do, I do enjoy the fact that it's uh, it's a very like, well used uh, my gen or uh, It's a Python-based thing, and you have this introspection into objects. Mm -hmm. You can actually, uh, there's, there's a lot of power to be harnessed there. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's not enough strict typing, which I think is coming in Python, but at the same time, 
Yeah. So, so there's a trade off between have the English expression and ease of expression. And yeah. Yeah, I'm very much on the typing side of things. So. Answer is I want control of the retiming, I guess. So, so my the kind of the reason I started this project was I was doing a bunch of pipelining stuff, and then if you're doing it in Verilog, you do underscore s1, underscore s2, and then you have to make sure you refer to things. And I still wanted that level of description. I did just didn't have to do it. I didn't want to do the work manually because it seemed so easy to automate. So, if you want more. Um, like you specify a latency and it does the retiming for you, you should like a look at uh, pipeline C, which is also another HL, HDL, and it does this iterative retiming automatically. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. So we are in the middle of the coffee break. Thank you so much, Franz, for your. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So please grab a coffee uh, and come back again to discuss with our hosted presenters. Thank you, Richard. And for turn, so probably come at 4.5, <laughs> so we can start on time. So thank you very much so far. So yes, choosing Rust is also nice because of all the internal uh, delays. All we do is to do a comparison of syntax tree and everything. Hi, Ming. Nice to meet you. I think nice to meet you. Uh, let me just um,
Okay. So we are resuming. So we were like four minutes late. Let me just check. I can't find whether this. Okay. We are still live on YouTube. Perfect. So I can put this back. We start now or in a minute? It's a little, it's a little bit. People are on breaks so. though. So may I ask you to um, return to your seats? Um, probably. So it's nice to see that uh, vibrant discussion. I hope to see it again later. So. Don't miss to exchange uh, contact information. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. Welcome to the second part uh, of this workshop, uh, open source design automation. So, um, it's uh, a very great honor for me to introduce Andrew Kang. He's very famous because of his um, ASIC flow, Open Road. And let's welcome Andrew and yeah, to his talk. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to OSDA 2023. Uh, as you can see from the logos, it's definitely not me. It's it's a whole bunch of very dedicated and talented people who have worked for five years on Open Road. Um, so I'm excited to see so many colleagues who are interested and who share the vision of open source EDA. And this is a talk about OSDA perspectives. Ah, thank you. From the Open Road project. So Open Road aims for no human in the loop tape out clean GDS, so RTL to GDS, in FinFET nodes in 24 hours. The project has over 600 tape outs in Foundry 130 nanometer to 12 nanometer. There's a growing community of contributors and supporters and Open Road supports education and outreach on many levels, whether through IEEE societies or the Google Skywater shuttles or contests and STEM workshops, etc. It's also the basis for research in both EDA and hardware design, and it addresses needs of small R&D teams that otherwise face too many barriers to getting ideas into silicon. So several flows have also been built upon Open Road. And the project owes a lot to its unique part partnership between academic researchers and the team of EDA veterans at Precision Innovations. So where is Open Road going? Well, we work on pretty much every green box you see here, which stretches our team's resources. But I want to mention two overarching directions. First is, what can we enable with unlimited copies running at the same time? And we've been working on cloud-optimized physical design, what we call Copilot. And this takes us strongly into the realm of machine learning to predict doomed subtasks and so on. There's also low-hanging fruit like black box hyperparameter optimization or auto-tuning, which finds superior flow settings than our internal design experts can. And they never imagined such things even were possible. And in this vein, we've spun up as many as 30,000 cloud instances at once in a project with Intel. The second overarching direction is to enable faster and more accurate exploration of architecture and floor plan options. Shortening the time to useful PPA feedback is very valuable these days. 
And so there's a new macro placer called hierarchical RTLMP, which understands RTL hierarchy and data flow. It delivers very human expert-like results. This is an AI accelerator in Global Foundry's 12LP with 760 macros. And we think users will start to auto-tune this new macro placer, use it for early design space exploration, build hybrid flows with commercial tools or other possibilities. Early design exploration also depends on partitioning that understands timing and modern constraints. So Triton Part is a very strong partitioner that is also new in Open Road. But um, I did not come from San Diego to give a 10 minute talk about Open Road. Um, it's much more important to think about, I feel, what can be the lasting outcomes from this workshop, including directions for open source design automation as a community. So what is this cartoon? It shows the hockey stick of area and power uh, on the y-axis versus clock period, which is increasing on the x-axis. So open source in red is worse than closed source in blue, which is worse than some unknown black optimal hockey stick. And the red hockey stick is basically all of us. The huge challenge then for all of us is shifting the red hockey stick from today to tomorrow. And the question is how? So I feel one answer to how is, you know, what we just saw. Develop better engines for key optimizations, jump in where traditional EDA vendors are uh, only wanting to tiptoe, like cloud or data for machine learning in an open way, hooks for machine learning and so on. But mm, that's not it. The real challenge and the most direct, important direction, in my opinion, is efficiency as a community. So open source EDA has a huge number of needs, too many, and not enough people. So I want to give a few thoughts about this. So thought number one is that bars matter a lot. Is it good enough? How relevant is it in terms of functionality, the data produced, the quality of results, and so on? Whatever the answer, is it measurably and continuously improving? Is it actively supported? And these are some aspects of good enough. And can I rely on it? Because there's student code versus professional code. There's training, documentation, user community, uh, availability, with what terms and conditions. And all of these bars questions, relevance and quality in particular, are always coming at academic and open source EDA. So one question to think about is, do we need more wood behind fewer arrows, as they say? Thought number two is, if it's infrastructure, it's a commodity. Infrastructure is not differentiating, it just needs to exist. So should highway signs be green or blue? Should stoplights be vertical or horizontal? I mean, pick one and move on. So I'm convinced that data model, database, STA, readers and writers, PDK support, loggers, extension language support, GUI, should be like plumbing and utilities, if they work, you don't think about them, which is also a bar. So in my personal universe, metrics 2.1 or open DB or open road or whatever, we need elements of some roadbed upon which we build a road ahead for OSDA and the open hardware uh, ecosystem. For instance, for research on machine learning in EDA, which has to include open data and explainable models and optimization benchmarking, we don't need five roadbeds, but we need at least one. And um, actually standards, interoperability, efficiency, frameworks, they're everywhere in the history of EDA and IC design. Without them, there's just fragmentation of resources and towers of Babel, which are just bad. So it really is a matter of putting more wood behind fewer arrows.
The third thought is we shouldn't forget that good proxies are essential to the development and adoption of open source EDA. What do I mean by this? Um, open source EDA is often rejected because there is poor validation or confirmation of relevance and value. And the root cause of this, if you really think, is that something somewhere was not shareable. Not shareable implies the need for high quality open proxies, proxy PDKs and enablements, proxy EDA tools that we can benchmark and record data from, proxy test cases that are relevant, that drive design automation and its <coughs> progress into the future. So if proxies are not good enough today, it actually blocks the entire community and this community needs to invest efforts accordingly. Um, it may be a journey, but there is a saying for that. So in conclusion, this really was an open road talk. Efficiency has always been the biggest challenge how can we move faster and achieve more as a community? So the three thoughts were, first, bars of critical mass, critical quality matter. Second, infrastructure is a commodity. It's not differentiating, so pick something and move on. And it's actually very harmful to try to build five different roadbeds, roadbeds when at the end of the day, your end goal is to have a road. Third, not shareable always ends up being a blocker, so we need to continually improve proxy PDKs, tools, and enablements. What will be the lasting outcomes of this workshop? Um, hopefully, new friendships and synergies formed today will take us more quickly to some better tomorrow. I look forward to the discussions you know, after we're done and during the breaks. Um, here is kind of the usual links slide just for the video. The third item in particular is a recent talk um, at an NSF workshop. And uh, thank you very much for being here today. I look forward to questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have my thoughts on a little bit septic. Um, because I think, firstly, there is in open source some kind of inefficiency is needed. So you have obviously to have some people who want to do it differently mm -hmm. than what is the common practice. Sure. And second thing is that you know, this discussion I'm not confident that we need to standardize things. But the last thing what I mentioned you want to do is to be involved in standardization discussions. So that's our two thoughts I oh. on my so. Sure. Um, excellent points. We are all, I think, self-selected to be uh, very pioneering, free-spirited, and uh, lone wolves, if you will. And there are a lot of single, passionate developer, open source projects out there. Um, it just so happens that um, to impact in a sustainable, stable way a, a larger community of education, workforce development, training, you know, bringing in a next generation of EDA researchers and developers. Um, I f personally believe that critical mass and critical, critical quality matter. And that's been the feedback we've had through five years of Open Road, through all the birds of the feather workshops at DAC. What did the community want? They wanted a full flow, then they wanted high quality software engineering, then they wanted support before they would even begin to kick the tires. And so we kind of lived through those first few years of the project and learned a lot about what people actually want to see. And we're so far from being where we need to be. That's why I perhaps think a lot about critical mass, critical quality, and how can we actually as a community support seven place and route you know, initiatives or something like that, when we don't have enough resources even for one, it seems. Uh, hope that makes sense. Yeah, so to be clear, I don't 
Yeah, no. there's a lot of fantastic work, and I feel like if if we share with each other the know-how that oh there is an open source FinFET capable detailed router out there, or there's another one at Chinese University of Hong Kong, or this is the one static timer that understands generated clocks and timing exceptions, you know, in a sort of industrial sense. Um, and we share this and build upon each other's uh, works, then we will move faster. Um, it, it's a matter of attitude, culture, personalities, of course. How about excitement? Excitement. Um, I think um, people get excited. I, I mean, I, I feel like the open lane folks must be very excited. The silicon compiler folks must be excited. You know, there's high school students, there's classes. Um, UC Santa Cruz Extension teaches a course based on open road in, in, in a couple of classes. And they, I think, are having a workshop two days ago on open road for ASIC design um, at UCSC ex Extension in the Valley. Um, there is some element of virality and excitement, but um, if you're a glass half full person, it's very motivating. If you're a glass half empty person, it, it is also motivating in the sense of, wow, there's so much left to do and so little time because you know the world moves fast. Moore's Law has always been 1% every week. <laughs> that's, that's been tough to keep up with. and, and that's why I, I bemoan redundancy and waste or inefficiency in, in some of the ways I mentioned. Sorry. <laughs> we, we should talk later. More questions? Thank you for the presentation. May I ask, I mean, can we, actually, most of you here is. I think we've always had that in mind, even the um, second program manager of the DARPA pro program that spawns so many projects in hardware and software, you know, had a, a vision of blue hat, <laughs> not red hat. And um, we've always talked about the Linux of EDA, that sort of thing. Um, indeed, uh, the funding agencies do support uh, sustainability initiatives, you know, how to take this into a freemium model or software as a service model, introductions to venture capitalists, and all of those possibilities probably are viable today. Um, on the other hand, people who work in open source EDA for these past years, as I said, are very self-selected. I mean, they escaped from venture-funded EDA startups and big EDA companies. So, you know, how to maintain uh, the attractiveness of open source development, the, the rewards that are very personal, uh, you know, seeing young people attracted to the field, um, without sort of saddling them with this yet another startup, you know, life that they don't want to return to. That's been kind of an a challenge. I think most people in the room who are in small companies are very self-selected to, to have the lifestyle of you know, doing good near often the end of their careers after decades doing the grind. And um, I, th I think personally I, I see this challenge in, in finding sustain, sustainable futures. We talk a lot to philanthropists and I understand others do as well. But you know, um, it, it's it's a few million dollars for each independent effort every year to even have six highly skilled developers plus some grad students and uh, you know contests or whatever. Um, there's a, not a lot of multiples of millions of dollars per year lying around for us to to harness. 
and I wonder how we will manage as a community to, to do the best we can with what we can harness. That's perhaps the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. Are there more questions? We still have some time. So let's use it. Okay. okay. So thank you very much, Andrew. Deep thoughts, big ideas that are um, definitely the um, main issues today. Uh, but this workshop is, of course, um, intended to bring people together to join forces, and hopefully, it will help in tackling these problems at least a little bit. So, um, this is now time for me to introduce our next speaker, Sean Bolshoi. He's with the uh, University of Solon. Yes. Um, and um, he's the lead author of Coriolis, uh, another basic flow. So, welcome, Sean Paul. Thank you. Um, um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, this one, okay. So, I'm Jean Paul Chaput, and I will present you uh, today uh, Coriolis, which is uh, a RTL to JDS2 toolchain that was developed at Sorbonne University. So here is a, a very simple, sim, sorry, I'm still uh, in front, okay. Uh, a very simplified view of the design flow. And uh, on the left, you have the hardware description language, whatever they are. Then we go through logical synthesis and then to the physical synthesis, and then we got the layout. To be uh, completely accurate, Coriolis is the blue part. This is the part that we specifically developed at Sorbonne University. But we have also developed a, a framework to manage all the, the tool of the chain. But the red one are third party, so developed outside of our lab, but we use them. When we developed Coriolis, we wanted to do something uh, different of what was done at the time, which is uh, be between uh, 15 and 20 years ago, we wanted to make integrated tools. That was the key point of making Coriolis. We, do not, we did not want to only share the database, the underlying <laughs> database, and having tools run one after the other, for example, run first the placement, then the global routing, and finally the data layer routing, what we wanted is that all the tools reside in memory at the same time. And they can be, uh, part of the tool can be run, no, the, the tools are run sequentially, but with part of them not in order. For example, typically we, uh, we use that to tightly integrate the global routing and the detailed routing, and some part of the uh, detailed routing are run before the global routing. And the fact that everything resides in memory allows us a full communication between the tools. We don't need files, we don't need uh, extra things. We can really bind the tool together very tightly. And this is a key point of Coriolis. So you have the, the, the database on the left. The end result of that is, fin and finally, we wrap everything in Python. The whole tool, the, the whole set of tools, is uh, completely scriptable in Python. I mean by that, that in the end, we don't have a binary. There is no one binary uh, with Coriolis. We have just a set of library, which is then bound by Python. We write the computationally intensive part of the tools in C++, put them in library, and then we assemble the library the, C, uh, the, the, the way we want. And we can, this is for experimental needs, so we can rearrange the tools, we can do a lot of experiment uh, with, uh, with Python, which is much faster than doing it with, uh, directly with C++ code. This is doing for, we do that for fast prototyping. So the, the end result is a mix of C++ uh, highly uh, efficient tools, and Python glue. 
and even maybe Python algorithm sometime. So part of it is written in Python, part of it is written in C++ in an almost seamless way. We can really uh, efficiently communicate between Python and C++. Um, so this did allow us to completely integrate analog design. Uh, there is one feature which is not represented here, but we will see uh, an example at the end of the presentation. We can completely mix analog and digital design. Um, in, there is no longer, if for the designer in the room, there is no longer analog on top or digital on top approach. It's seamless. This is still a demonstrator, but we have all the capabilities to do it, and we, we will achieve it uh, sometime soon. So, what the current capabilities of uh, Coriolis are? As making uh, ASICs is very difficult, I think uh, every people who, who try to make a GDS2, a, a GDS2, a GDS2 who passes all the verification is uh, aware of that uh, situation, it is very difficult. So we started uh, to, to target the mature node that is above uh, 130 nanometers, typically sky water. And we, we, we target mature nodes and we will uh, slowly go down to more advanced node as we add feature after feature. Mainly the, um, how much? Uh, the timing closure. So, uh, our future strategy, how, how, how do we manage to do that? As I said at the, the start of the presentation, we have completely integrated tools, but they still run basically sequentially. Even if some part of them can be run out of order, we are basically sequential. What we want to do to reach advanced node is uh, to uh, manage timing closure, and for that, we want to go to another level of integration between the tools. That is, instead of having the tool run sequentially, we want them to run step by step through a progressive refinement process. The idea is basically to make one step of placement, then perform uh, an analysis of the timing, extract some uh, constraints, some uh, information that will, guide, that, that will guide the next step of the placement. And that, uh, that in, involves global routing and placement. And we will go down progressively until all the objectives are met. So, and this is our next uh, big step. So this is the challenge. Uh, I think I didn't forget anything. Okay, so here is the first example of design that we do. Uh, this is the first stage of, uh, I think, an amplificate, uh, an amp-up. Uh, I don't know the, the exact name. So the point is that on the lower part, you see the analog design, the analog design. It's not very compact, because that was not the point here. Uh, this is a test example, and it is mixed with a, a decoder on top. The, the part on top, we see clearly it's a kind of a different layout. It's the digital part, it's made of standard cells, and it performs a decoding task, which controls uh, the little device, uh, which are uh, exactly below. You see the, the set of horizontal lines. And it's completely integrated. The router, for example, the, the, the global routing and the detailed routing are done with the same structure for both parts, analog and digital. And the analog part can manage, the, the, the detailed and global router can manage specific constraints of the analog part. So next, uh, what we did very recently is this uh, small uh, test chip with the pragmatic technology and it's uh, only a very small one, 760 standard cells. It's a small thermometer, uh, and it was made by Pragmatic with their flexible technology. It's a four uh, metal layer technology, for, uh, of which two are available for routing. So it's uh, kind of a bit tough for the router because it has only two metal, uh, two metal, uh, two metal layer for routing, and it was still able to complete in over-the-cell routing. And uh, 
the chip was made and it, it, it did work uh, at the first time with uh, a yield of around 70%. So it was uh, very interesting. So the next one is the biggest steal that we did with Coriolis. So it's uh, 1.3 million transistors. It's an implementation of a fibrous chip. It is, the, it is an open power architecture. So it's uh, quite different from uh, RISC V still. And we were partially able to test it due to some difficulties. Uh, we were only able to check the PLL, but that uh, says a lot for us because it means that the IO pads works. It means that the standard cell works, especially the day flip flop, because the PLL contains day flip flops. And the PLL did work and generate clock at the uh, expected speed. But to, due to some uh, problem out of our control, we were, we were unable to, to fully test the chip. And finally, we also made a little risk 5 through chip flow, which was sent to the MPW4 program from uh, Skywater. And uh, for that, we don't know if it works or, or not, because we, still, we are still waiting for the chip. So we won't be able to, to test it. Uh, the, the point of Coriolis, I mean, uh, just a little bit back, is that it's now, uh, it's, it's so much integrated with Python that you can describe your whole design with just one Python script. Even the uh, make file like dependencies and the, fa the fact that you want to run Yosis or that tool inside one Python script and not a very long one. Uh, in fact, in uh, those kind of script, the longest part is the description or where the IO pads are. If you are uh, 200 IO pads, then you, have, you need to have 200 lines, each one per IO pads. And the rest is just calling the tools. And it's fully customizable. You can do whatever you like. One another point is that with, Corio with the Coriolis project, not only do we want to uh, provide tools, but we also want to provide blocks and especially portable blocks. Uh, it is uh, a big problem, it has always been a big problem that when you change of te technological node, uh, most of the time you have, to, you have to do a lot of work uh, redoing or revalidating your standard cells, and it is, it is even worse for uh, analog blocks. So what we are also developing is portable analog blocks. And this will be uh, another outcome of the project. So I think I have uh, done it, maybe uh, a little too short. So no, I'm waiting for questions. Ah. Ah. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So if you have questions. Other questions? First, in fact, uh, in terms of chronology, we were the first. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. it's, we, we are, uh, we, we, the, the, the Coriolis project started uh, around the year 2000. So, but as we are a little team, we, we have to progress slowly and methodically through the tools. So this is why, uh, and we have, a, the, the problem is about the database, enfin, one of the problem is about the database. We developed a very specific database uh, exactly tailored to suit our needs. And it is difficult to, after a long time of developing uh, over it, to switch to another one. And for, uh, 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 I would say, it's not, uh, it's, it's not very beneficial. The, it's, it's just, if you change uh, the, your database, basically you do exactly, exactly what you have done before, but on another database. So unless there is a very big incentive to do it, I mean, you, 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 you gain something at the end, if it's just, uh, it just switching the database, at least for now it, now it has no interest. But uh, in fact, uh, 
as I said, we started more than 15 or 20 years ago, depending on the starting point. Uh, but we are thinking about changing our database. Uh, it, it may occur in the future, but it's, uh, it will be a slow move and uh, one which is uh, be very well uh, planned. I don't have a timeline yet. I know exactly what we have to do. We are in the process of hiring people and it will depend on if we succeed or not. It's, I, am, I cannot give you a, a definite timetable because uh, I, I don't know yet. It's too difficult to, to see now. But would like to see it done? <laughs> I'd like to see it done now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, uh, I would say it's almost working. So we... we it depends, it depends on the incentive. Uh, we can uh, refocus our uh, priority if there is a, 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 a demand. That's, uh, up until now, it was not our top priority because we have other requests. But uh, that can change. Thank you. So, uh, we Sorry, I don't hear you well. Sorry. Um, so there's a, there's a set of five, there's a set of libraries, and then you call in the things that you need, etc. So, and you set up uh, mostly, you store it in memory. Mm. So, how do you, let's say, comment the scalability of the, uh, of the colors? Because, you know, uh, computers so far, they have a limited memory, and so except the moment when you know, um, it's the, I think for now we rely on the memory. I mean, uh, we cannot, on, we can only manage chips that uh, that fits into the memory of the system. So, but uh, until now, uh, we have not reached that limit. I, I mean, we did not, we did not make very huge chip. The, the biggest one we make is the, the, the TSMC one, and I think it, were, it fitted in uh, less than 10 gigabytes. Ah, okay. So we, we, are, we are quite compact in memory. Okay, thank you. Thank you. More questions? There is space for one or two more questions. Okay, so thank you very much, Sean <laughs> Now it's a great honor for me to introduce uh, Merle. They are with um, Edinburgh University and most famous for uh, their work on Next PNR and FPGA routers. So please, Merle, thank you. So hey, I'm Myrtle. As I said, I'm, I'm at Heidelberg University. I've been with a couple of different places in the past, but um, throughout that I've been the lead developer and maintainer of NextPNDAR, an open source place and root tool that's targeted at real-world FPGA, real FPGA fabrics, so um, both commercial FPGAs, but more recently um, taped out academic FPGAs as well. 
So NextPMDAR, it's been in development since May 2018, so going on five years. In that time, a bit like a cat has nine lives, NextPMDAR's had about four or five different employers that have been paying me to work on it in um, slightly different capacities, but um, yeah, I've stuck with it and I have um, yeah, probably more loyalty to NextPMDAR than anything else at this point, so um, yeah, it's kind of my pet project as much as anything else, but um, yeah. It's an open source, it's targeted at multiple architectures, so we're not um, making sure none of the core code is specific to any particular FPGA. This isn't some throwaway research FPGA placer that was intended to work on one model of ultrascale with a restricted set of primitive. We're really looking to be able to support any functionality of any FPGA and provide a tool that um, yeah, real users can use for real designs. So um, yeah, more recently, as well as these various um, various commercial FPGAs that we support. We um, have also been working on support for academic EFPGAs, in particular fabulous EFPGAs, which will be the second half of my talk today. So one of the things I've worked on more recently in NextPMDAR, if you've ever looked inside the NextPMDAR details, um, the, the way the code is implemented, it has a fairly complicated API that you have to implement in order to add new FPGA families to it. And if you're implementing a big Xilinx FPGA, that's great, because it gives you a lot of control over things like data structures that you really need when you're scaling for a big FPGA. It enables you to implement the really complicated constraints you might get in, a, in an FPGA architecture, deal with all the things like I.O., SERDES, PLL, custom clock routing, complicated validity rules inside slices, all those kind of things. But when you're dealing with something like an EFPGA and you just want to throw something together quickly, implementing that big API generally involved just copying and pasting a bunch of code, and that really wasn't ideal. So Viaduct gives you a way of basically building up the representation of the FPGA in memory. It's only going to scale up to about 25,000 LUTs, but if you're just working with prototyping an academic EFPGA, want to bring up place and route quickly, it's perfectly good for that. And yeah, the core next PNDAR deduplicated custom API approach can go up well beyond a million LUTs in terms of database scalability, but yeah. We don't need that here. And the nice thing about Viaduct in terms of prototyping EFPGAs is you can still bring in a lot of the custom constraints and things that NextPNDAR give you that are really important in terms of easily, easily targeting real-world FPGAs, but you don't have to use them from the get-go. You can really start from less than a 1,000 lines of code to add a new FPGA into NextPNDAR. So um, I'm not actually going to talk that much about um, the core of NextPMDAR today, mainly because it hasn't actually changed that much since some of the previous talks that I've done, um, possibly looking slightly different. But um, yeah, um, and, but even back in those days, the core place and root algorithms haven't changed that much. There are some future plans, but um, yeah, they're, they're still down the line. But um, so yeah, on to Fabulous. Fabulous is an EFPGA fabric generator from, from Manchester and Heidelberg universities. Um, so it's for building custom FPGAs for your application. And it's a very customizable generator in a similar way to the spirit of NextPMDAR being a very customizable place and route tool. Fabulous is incredibly customizable in terms of the type of fabrics you can build with it. So it's not just throwing together your standard CLBs. It also has a lot of flexibility for including things like custom blocks. So things like DSPs, block RAM, register files, adding interfaces to hard CPUs. And you can also use its routing graph framework to build things like CGRAs as well, and things with coarse grain reconfigurability, hard wiring between IP cores, almost anything that you could put in an FPGA, the um, Fabulous framework is flexible enough to model as well. And we've been trying out Fabulous with some test tape outs on some of the open source Google Shuttle runs, which seem to have been quite a core theme throughout today's workshop, has been the, the new possibilities the shuttle runs have opened up, and actually probably a big change since we last sort of had these had these workshops kind of in the before COVID times is, is the possibilities that these open source shuttle runs have come back. And so instead of just theoretically talking about ASICs, you know, we're coming back with real chips and we're able to, to test real chips. And in our case, we have um, real FPGA silicon from MPW2 that's come back and it's working and we can build bit streams and run it. So um, yeah, I think this is actually mostly stuff that I've, I've talked about previously, but yeah, fabulous. It's flexible. It even supports both Verilog or VHDL, so you don't have to have a holy war. You can just pick, pick whichever one you prefer. As well as that, it can generate the data that NextPNDAR needs in order to place and route for that fabric. And of course, we have Yosis support for doing synthesis. It uses a latch-based configuration architecture. 
this is kind of always a trade-off. So the simplest approach of FPGA configuration is just having a shift register, but that's about twice as big because it needs D flip-flops instead of latches. And it's also less robust because as you're shifting things in through the fabric, you go through a whole different series of configurations every time you shift it. And there's actually a risk you can do things like build ring oscillators and things with those configurations you don't want. In an ideal world, you might use something like an SRAM cell for your FPGA configuration. But the problem is once you start doing that, that's an incredibly process specific thing. You can't then just easily change your primitive and rebuild your fabric. You've got to design a whole new custom primitive rather than just inserting a foundry cell. So that's why, why we settled on latch based configuration. And through our configuration interface that lets us reprogram individual lines of latches, that also gives us partial reconfiguration support without actually having to do any extra work. That just comes for free with our fabric design. So these are actually the two fabrics we, um, we taped out on MPW2. The one on your right is the one that I've mostly been working with. That's a pure FPGA. It's a slightly bigger FPGA, but um, yeah, it's got DSPs, block RAMs, register files, LUT4s. The one on your left is, um, is the one that has two RISC-V cores added to it, two IBEX hard RISC-V cores. That one is still a bit of a work in progress to bring up because of its higher, higher complexity, but um, yeah, that's, um, yeah, those are our two cores. And so to give you an idea of the kind of designs that we can build on this FPGA, um, this would actually be animated, but um, it's a little demo showing a whole bunch of different primitives, actually. So we have the block RAM, which is actually open RAM based. That's containing the texture data. We have DSPs, which are being used uh, in multiplies for the perspective transform. And then we have a bunch of general logic, which is just doing things like some multi-cycle dividers for the transform. And so yeah, this is actually like a, just like a little animated scrolling road output on VGA. I think this is about 500 LUTs or so of logic, plus the DSPs and, and all the block RAMs. So kind of in the scheme of the open MPW run so far, we're not quite dealing with perfection yet. The, um, this isn't actually quite the same as a lot of the hold time problems because this wasn't exactly a hold time problem because we mischaracterized stuff. It's a hold time problem because we simplified the clock architecture from a clock tree to a clock ladder. And that essentially means that some patterns of data routing will mean the data delay doesn't match the clock delay and you get hold time problems. And the idea always was that we should be able to fix this in next PNDAR, but um, yeah, there's a bit more work to actually get actually get the, the fix it in software done. Not least, we actually need to extract a um, a timing analysis out of, of the fabric and have a timing model for next PNDAR. And yeah, once we have that, I expect we'll have a, a pretty robust fabric working and something potentially where we can make some cute business cards or something and yeah, show our custom made FPGA fabric on an open process, which will be very nice. So talking a bit more about, um, about what our future plans are, there's one of the weak, weak spots of NextPNDAR has always been timing analysis. So as well as things like the hold time fix up that we'll need for those fabulous FPGAs, we also need to be able to do things like cross clock domain constraints. So you can constrain individual clock frequencies in NextPNDAR, but you can't do things like constrain the minimum maximum delay between clocks, multi-cycles, that kind of thing. So that's probably the biggest priority in terms of increasing the, the usability of NextPNDAR. NextPNDAR has a GUI. It's a bit of a basic GUI, but it's there. And um, one of the things that would be nice is actually to support fabulous fabrics in the, in the GUI. That's obviously a bit more complicated than what we've done in the GUI before, where we've had a fixed, a fixed FPGA like an ICE40, because people can make all manner of fabulous fabrics. And we have to work out things like the layout of wires and blocks in the GUI automatically. And then there's the usual stuff, which I think has cropped up in my plans on every next PNDAR presentation I've done of how we're going to improve the place and route in the future. Uh, my current project, something more of a personal project, is an electrostatic placer for next PNDAR. So that uses some, it's a very common algorithm in ASIC placement. It's becoming more intercepted in FPGA placement as well. And it uses essentially the principles of electrostatic to um, optimize the placement. So you imagine that your cells essentially charged particles and you have some forces pulling them together because you want to minimize wire length but you also have some forces pushing them apart because you don't want cells overlapping because that's not a legal placement and then you can do a whole bunch of maths and luckily maths is fairly well researched it's actually a big part of it interestingly boils down to some fast Fourier right. transforms which of course again very well researched thing so this can also be a pretty easy to accelerate placer as well because there's lots of existing work on doing for example GPU acceleration of these kind of 
kind of algorithms. And a couple of other people are working at the moment on some Rust bindings for NextPandars API. And this again might make researching things like parallel algorithms where Rust has potentially nicer paradigms for that than C++ available. So for example, one of the projects that was actually inspiring that was doing a partition-based router that would actually, for most of the nets that don't need to cross a large amount of the design, firing them off to different threads and just routing them entirely in parallel if it's known that they don't overlap. So that's kind of an idea of where the next PNR roadmap would like to lead. And uh, yeah, that's my, my email address if, if you have any questions and also a credit for the cat girl picture that's adorning the side of the slides. I think there's about 850 LUTs or so total, so yeah, just yeah, a bit over half utilization. I've tested some higher utilization things just as quick tests, so for example, making a chain of inverters that goes through every LUT just to get a rough idea that every LUT is working, but yeah. Is that a fairly typical utilization for an uh, we can definitely push a bit higher than that. So it does depend a lot on the, the, what depends a lot on the utilization is the um, essentially how dense the routing graph is. So ICE 40 FPGAs have a very very dense routing graph. We can push an ICE 40 FPGA well beyond 95% utilization. ECP5 is a bit less so. So probably 85% is the highest you want to go. Fabulous. We haven't really looked into it in great detail, but I'd guess again about 85% or so is the highest utilization that you probably really want to be using before you're going to start hitting at a minimum some timing problems. Thank you. More questions? Friends. So um, this is in terms of not the, um, of course, it, yeah, it, it supports Verilog or VHDL for the designs because it uses the OSIS and you can use Tutorial. This is in terms of the Verilog that Fabric, Fabulous generates for the FPGA fabric. Oh, okay, right. So yep. that's, that, that's a net idea. list basically of, of uh, basically essentially it's a net list of latches and muxes essentially plus whatever other primitives you have. Right, and that's what gets synthesized to the silicon. Yeah. Who's next? Yep, so so for each tile type, so we have I think in that fabric basically, aside from like the tiles around the edges, um, we have like basically three basic tile types, um, the LUTs, the register files, and the SPs, plus, yeah, we have some edge tiles, and the block rams are separate blocks, but yeah, each one of those is basically placed placed and routed as, as a fixed macro, and then just stamped out, like, 100 times across, across the chip or whatever. And that's the same question I asked before. Do you, do you see applications of this uh, where the FPGA is, is used as Yeah, definitely. So, so that's probably going to be one of the topics of my PhD thesis is things like designing the ideal FPGA for an application specific thing. So maybe there are specific kinds of, um, of, of DSP blocks, for example, that would suit a certain application best or the, or the split between FPGA and hard, hard macro. Or maybe you can, for example, for an SSE, for example, you would have today's crypto algorithms as hard blocks, but then have some FPGAs fabric in order to implement what crypto algorithms might come out in the future that you might want to accelerate as well if it's a, a long lifetime IoT project or something. Thank you. More questions? So, um, yeah, to be honest with you, I think, yeah, one of the big things is that um, 
we have this kind of high level of, of, of customizability, but also simplicity. So we have like incredibly, um, incredibly like um, non, um, non, uh, non kind of, we don't, you're not kind of forced into any particular way. We're kind of very focused on like exploration and having a, a, a code base that's easy to hack around with. And um, yeah, incredibly simple format for specifying things like how your routing graph looks. So you can really easily play around with different routing graphs, that kind of thing. And we also have, yeah, I think probably a bit ahead in terms of, in terms of things like playing with the shuttle runs and stuff. So yeah, that's kind of, I think where we are. Thank you. More questions? No? Okay, so, Myrtle, thank you very much again. <laughs> and finally, it's very pleasurable for me to uh, welcome our last speaker for today, Tristan Schumburg. I hope I uh, almost pronounced correctly. <laughs> So for those of you uh, who don't know him uh, yet by name, uh, you would, um, um, so Tristan is the, the author of GHDL, very famous VHDL um, simulator, very famous person. I'm really looking forward to your talk now. Okay. Thank you. So it's not a talk exactly about GHDL, but more about how GSDL is could be seen inside the uh, open source ADA ecosystem. So you have a lot of many talks about ecosystem today. Okay, so quickly, it's GSDL started as a simulator. It supports most of the standard, at least until uh, 28. Uh, there is a plan to support uh, 2019 once uh, 28 is completely supported. Um, it's a compiled simulator, so it uh, generates at the end uh, object code. And the structure of it is made to support multiple backends. So you can, you can see GHDL as a GCC frontend, like uh, C++ or uh, there is also Go frontend or whatever Fortran. It's, does it, there is no intermediate generation of C code. It can also be used with LLVM, and there is also an internal uh, code generator named Encode, which has the advantage of being very fast in generating, I would say, rather good um, object code. Uh, it's quite fast, uh, at least to do the code generation, but uh, the speed of simulation is not that fast, uh, in particular if you, don't if you use a lot of, uh, of, uh, of signals. Uh, I hope uh, we have uh, good error messages and I hope also hope we uh, fix bugs quicker than the industry. Not sure, but probably. Um, it's a few, few uh, full uh, common line uh, tool, so there's no graphical user interface. And in order to debug your, your circuit, you can use uh, GTK Way, which is also a famous uh, uh, waveform uh, GUI. And to do that, you can also you can either generate a VCD output, which is slow and large, or we can also generate uh, a specific format designed for uh, GHDL and uh, GTK Wave named the uh, .ghw5 format, which is a little bit more compact and more powerful. Uh, because it generates code, you can do some debug of your model using GDB, but it's a little bit uh, uh, not completely nice. Uh, because with um, because it uses, you can use GCC as a backend, you can do some coverage with Jcov. Uh, that's something also to be improved. And it supports most of the, at least of the open source uh, verification framework like uh, UUV, UUVM or uh, OSVVM. Um, to open doors, uh, what we'd like to have in the future is to, ha is to be able to do mixed language simulations. So right now, 
if you want to simulate both uh, Verilog and VHDL uh, or system Verilog designs, uh, you cannot do that easily. And I think this is a real missing piece in uh, at least for uh, for the VHDL world. Um, even for uh, very long, there is no, I would say, easy to use ID. Um, that's also something that we that need to be to be done to be able to easily debug, to easily uh, view your uh, output without uh, something a little, little bit more uh, interactive than the TK wave. Um, in a different sector, there is, I think there is also, I have never seen any presentation of tool to be able to design, to do design with uh, graphical blocks, like uh, it's possible with Vivado. Um, maybe Python is a better solution. Maybe not always, I'm not sure. To be something, some, something to be discussed. Uh, there is also the topic of uh, schematic viewer, so it's, we want something to be better than uh, uh, GraphViz, something more interactive, more easy to reproduce, to investigate. I think this is also a missing piece in the open source ecosystem. Okay, it's not very fun as a project, but that's something that something it, it could be it could do also useful. And for the system, very log uh, landscape. Uh, I think there is no open source simulator that can support UVM, which is a graal of verification, at least in the industry. But I have heard of some uh, work in progress in this, uh, in this area. Um, there is this uh, GHDL language server, which, is, which provides a uh, language server for VHDL. And uh, so the integration with uh, Emacs or VS Code or whatever, it allows to do. Uh, well, it's quite good to do navigation, and there is some support of reformatting and uh, insertion. I would say, okay, I am maybe maybe not the only user, but one of the few users, and it quite improves the productivity because when you start the simulation, there will be no syntax error. It will ideally it always. Uh, work immediately. Another thing to be, I think, would be nice to discuss, uh, maybe for people outside of the FOSS uh, EDA community, is why do we want to have uh, open source uh, EDA tools? Um, One of the issues with, at least with simulator and maybe also with synthesizer, that, uh, okay, Xilinx or um, Altera Intel, they offer the, at least free version for small FPGA and it, it's, they are the, um, uh, a very competitor for uh, open source tools, at least in, for the maker community which are still. Uh, a large community. Uh, okay, so we don't want to target exactly this uh, community. It's, we, maybe it's a bit too hard uh, initially. Um, what we'd like maybe to target is also the industry. And it's okay, it's, it, it's a bit like uh, open road. Um, open source tool allow uh, industry to make uh, some uh, try some experiment with a uh, tool without investing a lot of, uh, of money. The other possibility is this uh, no license uh, restriction, so you can run many instances of any open source tool at, uh, at the same time, which allow you to do uh, a lot of uh, verification or a lot of uh, state exploration. Uh, recently, well, maybe few years ago, I added synthesis support for GHDL. Um, what we have to understand is that it only generates a netlist, which is completely unoptimized, and generates either VHDL or very long netlist. Mm -hmm. And then it is integrated with Josis in order to do uh, optimization of this netlist. 
An interesting aspect of it is that the support of uh, PSL, well, both for simulation and for uh, synthesis, which allow you to do some formal verification using uh, symbiosis, which is uh, quite interesting, except that PSL is not what they use compared to system log uh, assertion. Uh, okay, so again, we'd like to also to support uh, multi-language uh, for synthesis. There is currently uh, incomplete support with Yosis because you can instantiate in the HDL a very log design, but there is a limited support for parameters of, uh, of generics. Uh, it would be also nice to be able to support uh, cross-module probing for doing uh, debugging, uh, real-time real -time debugging. And it might also be interesting to be able to do uh, cross-language cross type definition so you can more easily mix uh, uh, structure of, or records defined in one language uh, with another language. Uh, finally, um, I have a rant about uh, vendors. Maybe there are some here, I don't know. Um, we all know that they are a heavy user of uh, open source uh, software. For example, uh, many ideas are based on Eclipse. Uh, there are a lot of users of uh, LLVM or GCC. Uh, TCL, of course, is a, a de facto script for uh, EDA. A uh, lot of Linux is used everywhere. Unfortunately, okay, they somewhat contribute back to this project, but it would be very nice if they were also more open in their format in their bitstream uh, and for simulation if they don't uh, encrypt everything because okay we don't have the key and so we are a little bit limited in what we can support with uh, uh, simulation with for, uh, uh, for the FEG. Um, at the end we can say that there is a long story of open source in the ADA uh, right, it's at, it starts back at least from uh, Spice, who everyone uh, knows. It's still continuing um, in many, many directions, in many, many universities, and in many, many also communities uh, outside universities. Um, I think there is some still missing tools, like I said before, in particular, uh, ID, it would be something that would be, it's not, it's not a very fun project, but I think it's something that is also needed. Uh, and again, I think that still uh, EDA vendor should be more open, if only they were. <laughs> Thank you. So it seems this is the perfect talk for ending this workshop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good messages and a lot of to do's to attract um, yeah, young persons that want to get involved into uh, free and open source um, ETA development. Um, so, are there any questions? No. First of all, there are many questions. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned with the mixed language synthesis, have you looked into the USIS RPC framework that lets call a front-end with a set of parameters? Um, yes, no. Uh, the point that, okay, I want to do, I no, not only want to do uh, multi-language I also want to support multi-language uh, simulation, so in that case, in this case, this is a bit out of this uh, equation. And I also want to have the possibility of uh, mixing uh, types definition in language, which also make it a bit difficult with this. Uh, so yes, I am aware of that, uh, but I don't plan to use it uh, at least in long term. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, about five years ago, I had suddenly started using GHDL and kind of saved my life. Okay. <laughs> Not having an open source compiler was a, was a open yeah. Um And I want to say that I 
I've used I'm one of the users of your uh, your sys GHDL plugin. Um, I've I've successfully managed to simulate a large chunk of GHDL on the very very side. Uh, I, I would say not 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 a small design. So, okay, okay, okay. Uh, it, it's of course the, the number of signals that you get are enormous sometimes, but but uh, to a certain extent it's uh, it's available. Um, and I'm just curious to know, because you listed so many things to do, uh, I would like to hear more from you about your priorities on that. Because everything seems like this could be nice, it would be nice. But well, as a priority form? <laughs> <laughs> no, as like, what would you like to see be done most? And, and if so, like, just to have, have an idea of what you're thinking. No, okay, what I plan to work on is mixing. No, no, okay. yeah. Sure, yes, we would like to hear that. Also, uh, Okay, well, yeah, what, what I'd like to work on is uh, mixed language simulation. What I'd like to see, I think I will be very, very happy to have a schematic viewer. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of research about... Uh, HDL schematic Yes. Okay. Because, okay, um, okay, if you do some... Uh, uh, design and you need to understand why there is a problem with your design, you often need to use a schematic viewer. But, but it's, that's one way to work. Yeah. Thank you. 
Right, just to comment a little bit, uh, at least on the support part, I think it's true that uh, maybe you can find a lot of uh, information about uh, open source tools on the, on the web and a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, it's also always surprising to me that when I, ca okay, if there is some bug and can quickly fix, I can do it in well, a few days, no problem. And often people are very surprised of the speed compared to the industry. No comment. <laughs> No, there is, there is, okay, there is no plan. Um, I think during the ISC period, uh, most of the ISPs were completely open when it was uh, VHDL or, uh, well, most of the time it was both VHDL and Verilog, and VHDL could handle them without any issue. And nowadays, with uh, Vivado, it's more and more encrypted. And okay, uh, what can we do except okay? If it's if we want to stay legal, what can we do? <laughs> I, I okay. I don't have any. There is no channel of communication open between you and Zion, and they don't care at all. No, no. Uh, you know, Zion provides their own simulator, so. I don't see any way I could try to convince them to open it a bit more. Because there. Works to request our own those things, so there must be an agreement. There. Yeah, yeah, sure. They have, they have an agreement. Yeah, they have an agreement with Quest, uh, well, with the uh, with the vendors, but not with any open source uh, tool. There's another question from Rob. Yeah. Uh, So it's more just about the Zilinx thing. I think it is something that if people have contacts at Zilinx, then it's definitely worth pushing on because we did previously get them to re-license the unencrypted primitives or set of the unencrypted primitives as I think it was Apache 2 instead of a commercial license. So it is possible to get them to budge on things. It just, just requires small steps. So it's probably not something that should be written off altogether. It won't happen overnight. But, but yeah, if people know you can buy up at Zilinx, then yeah. Well, we can just uh, <laughs> hope for the best. Yeah, oh, great, that you, yeah. great that you said that, because I was going to comment on the code, I'm sure, and it would be nice. So, you know, there is hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Mm. And there's also the serenity prayer, which says, you know, God grant you the wisdom to um, change the things that you can accept what you cannot change and the wisdom to know the difference. And there's also, you know, what is the best alternative in any negotiation or discussion? You know, if the, there is no compelling reason for a highly consolidated duopoly or triopoly to, to blink or to change things, it won't change. I mean, we are in a very mature and semiconductor industry. So I think this is why, whether it's in, you know, uh, actually, you know, this special session at ICCAD about a mixed open and proprietary EDA commons. You know, why do we have these sorts of discussions? It's because really the situation is quite static, and the only community that can move or hopefully will be willing to move is to be open source EDA community. It's not going to be the incumbents. So I sort of highlight that it was, I mean, we can all be hopeful, but the reality is we don't have time and uh, we don't have people. So what are we going to do differently? 
outcome of this workshop that was envisioned. Um, I mean, it, I understand we all learn a lot about each other and about self-care, but um, concretely, between ne this year and next year, what uh, structurally the change in the Boston community would be a question. Okay, <laughs> thank you and thank you to Christine. Any more comments or questions? Okay, okay. No, no response. Wait, uh, no, nobody's going to raise their hand and say, I want to donate this or I commit to do this. I'm sorry if I said ah, you, you want an immediate answer. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like to have an immediate answer. Yeah. yeah. Because that's what we do. <laughs> I mean, somebody says, I'm going to open source this bed or I'm going to develop this vertical benchmark. I'm going to oh, you know, provide a test bench for this so we can do you know, a calibrated power calculation, a dynamic power calculation, vector lifts, vector. I mean, there's so much stuff. SI, CCS, I mean, in the ASIC world, of course. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's a huge list. And, you know, who's going to help drive this or create the building block? We, we kind of look, we, we kind of stay under the lamppost, if you don't have a joke. You know, looking under the lamppost where the light is better. Um, but there's a lot of other um, parts that are not very illuminated that still need to be um, handled. So, Stephanie's silence, I understand, I'm sorry. Everybody's <laughs> expecting you to do these. <laughs> <laughs> we try with um, a very finite resource. I, I know. And, um, having, It's a, it's outside, 
I think best clock rate and best area is the light under the lamppost and the problem I think is a little bit off to the side of, uh, outside the lamppost. The second problem I have is a little more money, probably easier to solve. It's simply a naming problem, which is that the uh, timing reports that I get from FPGA tools make it difficult for me to relate it back to where the issue is you know, in, the, in, in the source code. So that's, that's a small, much smaller, but more mundane, but also equally useful problem. Because, and I'm saying why the timing is difficult, really why it's difficult, again, and maybe because I'm an IT user, it's because the names chosen on the path are often on FPGA fabric terminology, this pin or that lot, etc., on which I have no interest. I want to know in my RTL, where was it? And, and sometimes the naming, because of the chance choice of choosing one name, which might connect to many different points in the net, it's the wrong name for the path that I want, right? So it's a little bit of a mundane problem, but that's a one, one thing on my list. Those, those are the two big things on my list. Yes, I'm using the model. Just a comment, um, you know, what Intel calls interactive RTL, it, it's a problem for ASIC folks as well, where they want a 15 hour SPNR to become you know, 10 minutes. And this has been a challenge from almost every company on the planet um, in the ASIC world as well. And so, you know, Open well, Road, for example, has RMP, and Mapper has you know, incremental global placement where you swap in a different sub networks and kind of fix up what you had before. It's, it's far from ready to show anyone, but yeah, we understand this is a huge problem. And maybe, you know, since there's electrostatic places, you know, in the view for the PGA tool chain, you know, the same code even could be used. Uh, as a comment. And about naming in, again, the async world, the report formats and the names are actually copyrighted. And so there is a constructive Tower of Babel in the commercial EDA world. If you look at, I think, our announcement in 2019, we actually published safe naming conventions in Open Road that were directly given to us by a company that had survived a, a lawsuit from a bigger EDA company, and they had to clean up their names. And so, even by construction, we have to adopt safe names and safe timing reports. We can't actually match any existing timing report in your own timer, otherwise you can sue. So um, we have this kind of problem, and again, that's where one road bed instead of five road beds, or one, you know, this is how we report a tiny path with up arrows or down arrows or R's and F's or with uh, this column to the left of that column. All we need is one common way of doing it. And that will help a lot in my country. Thank you very much. It's done. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>there will be a next edition of OSTA and be the first one to know about it. So thank you very much for your interaction. Um, I guess this was a very successful first in-person event after the pandemic. Um, so yeah, hope to see you again. For the, uh, for the users on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and activate the bell.
good. Where is the mouse? Ah, here it is.